No way to be absolutely certain whether the pilot was injured until they got him out of that damn chair. All right, I need you to listen to me, bro, Dempsey said, all business. The a-holes who shot us down are coming. I can guarantee fucking tea that, so we need to be ready. The pilot nodded. How far did we go after we got hit, and in what direction? I turned us northeast toward the lake. The blast didn't take out the rotors, so I kept us flying until I lost my hydraulics and flight controls. That's when I brought her in. The pilot let out a slow, shuddering breath. We flew a bit before we screwed it. Ten miles. Maybe more. Sorry I blew the landing. Dempsey shook his head. Are you kidding me? You did great, man. You saved all our asses. As far as helo crashes go, this ranks as my best ever. The pilot raised a brow. How many helo crashes you been in? One. Then, with a shit-eating grin, he said, Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Don't worry about me. I'll just be hanging out. Dempsey climbed back into the cargo compartment and looked at the port side slider door overhead. If the pilot was right about opening up some distance from the shooters, then he'd bought them some time. If the Gila wasn't pouring out smoke like some giant marker beacon, they might be lost on the horizon, well beyond the shooter's line of sight. Better go find out. Junk, come help me with this door, Dempsey called. The SEAL officer nodded and made his way forward. It took both of them straining to pull back the insanely heavy door. Then Dempsey scrambled out the opening and sprawled prone on the top of the tipped-over helicopter. From the elevated vantage point, nine feet, Dempsey estimated, he began scanning the desert over his rifle sights. Seconds later, Chunk joined him, scanning the opposite 180-degree arc. How's Patch? Dempsey asked. Compound fracture. Tibby is snapped in half. Fibula seems to be intact. Arterial bleeding. Did he need a tourniquet? No, I splinted the leg. He's a tough motherfucker, that one. The whole time I was working on him, the only name he cursed in vain was yours. Yeah, yeah, Dempsey mumbled. Far off to the south, a hint of a dust cloud on the horizon caught his eye. Hey, take a look south, two zero zero. Chunk shifted his body. That kick up a dust on the horizon? You think that's the shooters heading our way? It's the right direction. Shit. How far you reckon they are? Dempsey performed a quick line of sight calculation using mental thumb rules combining the height of the dust cloud and the height of their vantage point. Twelve miles, Max. That's not good. Anything to the north? No, clear to the north. I can just make out the lake on the horizon. Even if we can get the pilot out, we won't make the lake. With Patch on a busted leg and our jacked-up prisoner, we'd be lucky to make two miles, Dempsey said, his anger rising. Fuck. What I wouldn't give for a little bird right about now. Did you call it in? Can't. Chunk said, grim-faced. My phone has power but no signal, and the helicopter's comms are toast. How about you? Well, shit, yeah, how about me, Dempsey thought, chastising himself for not checking his sat phone five minutes ago. He rolled onto his side and slid the phone out of his pocket. After a boot-up period, the compact little phone acquired a usable satellite signal— a second later, a small envelope appeared in the bottom of the screen. Dempsey smiled. We might be good here, he said to Chunk. He skipped the message, which of course was from Smith, and pressed the number two on the keypad. There was a single chirp in his ear. The call connected, and then came Smith's worried voice. Are you okay? Talk to me. Been better, Dempsey said, and looked over at Chunk and gave a thumbs up. We need Nexville, like right fucking now. We got two wounded, a team guy in our ISIS captive, and a pilot who's pinned in the wreckage of the helo. What the fuck happened? Dempsey shook his head in frustration. Time for that later. He squinted at the southern horizon, where the dust trail seemed to be growing larger. We've got at least two trucks loaded with shitheads closing on our position. We need the cavalry. A little bird or a drone carrying hellfires. I'm messaging Baldwin now to triangulate your signal, and I'm trying to get the JSOC commander online. Stand by and I'll be right back with you. Smith was gone without a parting word. Dempsey snapped the phone shut and looked over at Chunk. Gonna be tight, Chunk said, his characteristic grin notably absent. If the j f has a quick reaction force stood up in Baghdad, we could get a quick launch and still have a chance. Otherwise, Irbil is too fucking far. By the time they get here, it will be over.
Maybe they have a predator in the air. What are the odds of that? Coin flip at best. Chunk said flatly. My thoughts exactly. So what's our next move? We have to dig in and plan for the fact the cavalry ain't gonna make it in time. Let's get the pilot free and see if we can't set up the 50 cals. If we can position those heavy machine guns for cover fire, it may buy us some time. Then looking the SEAL officer in the eyes, he said, Booyah, frogman. Booyah, Chunk barked back. Dempsey watched him disappear into the crumpled helicopter. It was not lost on him that Chunk had looked to him for both direction and affirmation. In the teams, a senior NCO like Dempsey, with tons of experience, worked closely with the mid-grade officers. Hell, they often led the ops when circumstances demanded. In the heat of the moment, Dempsey had instinctively slid into the NCO role and taken control. He stared at the phone in his hand and willed it to chirp with good news. Come on, Shane, he whispered. I need you, bro. You coming or what? Chunk called up from below. On my way. He glanced one more time at the dust cloud on the horizon before lowering himself into the hole. Too many SEALs had died in this shithole country on his watch. He had no idea how he was going to get Chunk and the others out of this mess, but one thing was certain. He'd either find a way or die trying. and never at night. When he'd gone through Bud's, the instructors had made his cohort watch the movie Jaws before a five-mile swim in the shark-infested waters around San Clemente Island. The message wasn't to fear the ocean. It was that, for a seal, the sea was an ally. It was escape. It was victory. Get to the surf, fin out beyond the breakwater, and the ocean would swallow you up and conceal you from enemies seeking to destroy you. The nostalgic allure was so powerful, he suddenly felt a compulsion to slip over the railing and disappear, leaving the hamster wheel of missions, responsibility, and killing behind. It would never happen. Some dumbass has to run in the hamster wheel, he thought with a chuckle. Might as well be me. SDV is en route from the Illinois. Munn said in his ear from the bridge where he was once again at the controls playing skipper. Five mics. Check. Charger 3, bring up the package. Two double clicks in his ear told him Latif had heard him. Dempsey scanned the horizon looking for a periscope, which he knew was nearby playing peekaboo with the rolling waves. The USS Illinois, a Virginia-class fast-attack nuclear submarine, was waiting for their arrival. He felt the yacht slow to idle as Munn eased off the throttles. Below decks, Martin had been seeing to the rescued hostages who, despite being a little dehydrated and undernourished, were in physically good condition. Psychologically, however, the women had a long road ahead. Latif had been assigned to watch Al Fakuri while they transited. After the event with Malik, Dempsey had given Latif the babysitting assignment on purpose, as a show of confidence, but also to make the point never to underestimate an enemy no matter how benign the perceived risk. With one final deep breath, Dempsey said goodbye to the sea, turned on a heel, and marched aft. He gave Mon a ball cap salute as he walked past the bridge and the salon toward the party deck. He circled the hot tub and stepped over Malik, whose body was wrapped like a mummy in a bedspread from the main cabin, held in place by paracord. Dempsey pursed his lips and stared at the corpse. Two decades fighting jihadi terrorists, and he had never encountered one who'd transformed like this dude. The speed, the way he'd capitalized on a moment of inattention, the look in his eyes. Malik had executed his escape attempt like a professional soldier, which was why Dempsey had made the call to hand the corpse over instead of sinking it when they scuttled La Traviata. 
Dempsey bent at the waist, grabbed several strands of paracord, and dragged the corpse across the party deck and down a few short steps to the stern platform at the very back of the yacht, the dead man's head conking each tread as he did. Once on the platform, he shoved the body against the hull so it wouldn't accidentally roll overboard. Behind him, he heard commotion and looked up to see Latif leading a hunched and shuffling Alpha Kuri toward him. The terrorist's wrists and ankles were bound, and he wore a black hood over his head. "'How's our new friend doing?' he said to Latif. "'He has little to say,' Latif answered. "'Nothing, in fact.' Well, what a good little soldier of the jihad, Dempsey said, climbing the half-flight of steps to join them. He patted the terrorist on the shoulder, and the man recoiled. We need to get our friend all set for his swim. Latif looked up at him, brows arched. We're not going to— Yeah, we are, Dempsey said, flashing the green beret a sly grin. So he'll need a heeds bottle. Latif shook his head and chuckled. Okay, but what if he runs out of air? Then I guess their corpsman will just have to revive him. Latif gave him a you're a sick bastard, you know that, look, and then marched off to get the emergency breathing apparatus Dempsey had requested. Dempsey turned his attention back to the sea and scanned for signs of the SDV, the mini-sub used by SEALs to travel to the target while their host submarine loitered off the coast in deeper water. If he squinted, he thought he could just make out a shadowy silhouette fifty yards off the stern. "'You should have visual on the SDV any second, J.D.' Munn said in Dempsey's ear. "'Check,' he said. "'They'll ask for John. You'll authenticate India and make the handoff.' Latif returned holding a Heeds Three emergency egress compressed air bottle, just as Dempsey was maneuvering Alpha Kuri down to the stern platform. A stream of bubbles surfaced just off the deck, and a beat later, two seals in full combat load and dive gear broke the surface. One kicked back a few yards and raised his assault rifle while thinning in place. The closer seal emerged with a Sig Sauer P226 pistol pointed directly at Dempsey's chest. After a beat, he raised his mask. Dempsey recognized the man instantly. At six foot six and two hundred thirty pounds, Master Chief Sean White was one of the largest SEALs Dempsey had served with. His muscular physique and leading man good looks had earned him the handle Hollywood in the teens. White was one of only a handful of African American SEALs from Dempsey's generation. He and White had served on different teams most of the time, but they had operated together on several occasions early in their careers and had hung out socially. Shit. Dempsey thought, adjusting his ball cap. This could be a problem. Howdy, I'm John, Dempsey said, changing his voice to incorporate a little Texas twang while subtly rolling down his sleeves. The serpentine scar that wrapped his left forearm was the one defining feature that would betray his former identity. After the explosion in Djibouti, when the surgeons were putting him back together, the face guy had tweaked his nose, but no amount of work could hide the damage done to that arm. White spat out his regulator. Authenticate? The seal boomed in his deep, distinctive voice. India, Dempsey said, resisting the urge to rub his shaggy beard. Thank God for the beard and his long hair. You have something for us? White said, all business. Like a highlight reel in his head, memories of kicking ass side by side on their first deployment flashed through Dempsey's mind. He felt an overwhelming urge to wrap his one-time brother up in a bear hug and trade war stories, but he couldn't. The SEAL named Jack Kemper, the man Dempsey had once been, was officially dead and buried. Setting his jaw, Dempsey pulled the plug on the memories and simply said, Yeah, party boy here, and then kicking the corpse at his feet, and his friend. He turned and waved a hand at Latif, who guided Al Fakuri to the edge of the platform. Dempsey took the terrorist by the arm, jerking him roughly to get his attention. Listen very carefully. You're about to go for a swim. I'm going to put something in your mouth. Latif handed him the Heeds bottle, a miniature scuba device only slightly taller and wider than a can of soda, with a black rubber mouthpiece sticking out from one side. Dempsey shoved the bottle under the hood, finding the man's mouth and forcing the regulator in. 
Breathe through your nose until you hit the water because you'll only have maybe 20 to 30 breaths in this thing. He felt the terrorist shudder and shake his head. And bite down hard. If it falls out, no one will know you've drowned until they get you inside the lockout chamber. And no one will give a shit, quite frankly, so don't struggle and try to breathe slowly. Watching from the water, White screwed up his face in disapproval. He stowed his cig and held up a second octopus backup regulator intended for buddy breathing. Dempsey met the SEAL Master Chief's gaze and flashed him a look that said, I know, I know, just having a little fun with this piece of shit. A beat later, White's expression changed and recognition flashed in his eyes. Do I know you? I don't think so, Dempsey said, his grin fading. Yeah, okay, White said, but he looked like he'd seen a ghost. You remind me of someone I know, uh, well, used to know. There's a lot of motherfucking Joneses out there who look and talk like me, Dempsey said, amping up his twang and running his tongue between his lower lip and teeth, if you know what I mean. White's expression softened, and he actually chuckled at that. Amen, brother. Dempsey seized Alpha Curry by the shoulders and felt the man trembling in his grip. They tell me this guy's important, so look after him. His friend is just luggage and won't require any air. On cue... Latif dragged the mystery corpse down to the edge of the platform and rolled it unceremoniously into the water. The second seal finned over, grabbed the corpse, and disappeared under the water. Remember, Dempsey said in Alpha Curry's ear through the hood, breathe slowly. Shaking his head, the seal master chief finned backward a yard, donned his mask, and popped his regulator into his mouth. Then he gave Dempsey a wave, signaling he was ready. With a twinge of evil satisfaction, Dempsey shoved Alpha Curry off the edge of the platform and into the water. The terrorist submerged briefly, then kicked furiously to the surface, trying to keep his hooded head above the water. Dempsey watched White wrap thick, powerful arms around the man, pull the terrorist beneath the water, and disappear into the deep. A beat later, an empty black hood floated back up the perfect metaphorical exclamation point for this unorthodox prisoner exchange at sea. Dempsey and Latif looked at each other and busted up laughing. As they made their way back to the bridge, Latif said, Did you know that guy? Nah, Dempsey said. Why? I don't know. Just seemed like the two of you might have been buds once upon a time. The corner of Dempsey's mouth curled up. Once upon a time, maybe. He sent Latif down to check on Martin and ready the liberated hostages for their impending exfil before wandering to the bridge to caucus with Munn. Had the handoff go, Munn said, turning to look at him. Slick, Dempsey said. But dude, you could have warned me. Warned you about what? Master Chief Sean White, that's what. Hollywood was the fucking welcome wagon. No shit, Munn said, grinning. Well, I'll be damned. How is he? Dempsey shook his head. You're such a dick. Did he recognize you? It was touch and go there for a minute. Maybe. Munn clasped a hand on Dempsey's shoulder. Seriously, bro, I didn't know. If I had, I would have warned you or had Latif manage the handoff. It was bound to happen sooner or later. It's a small community. Yeah, it is, Munn said. And there's only one Hollywood. They shared a nostalgic smile, and then Dempsey said... Is the Hilo inbound? Yeah, it will be here in 12 mics. And then Adamo wants us for some new tasking. Dempsey nodded, then looked around at the beautifully appointed pilot house with a knot in his stomach. Are we set to scuttle this bitch? All set, Munn replied. We'll do it remotely from the air once we're clear. I have it set to blow in series so she goes down bow first. Fucking shame, though. Munn added with a theatrical sigh. I could get used to having one of these. Hell, if I can keep it, I'll even let you call me Captain Dan and drive your tired, ugly ass around wherever you want to go. Dempsey laughed. Someday, maybe, but it won't be on a boat like this. We'll be lucky if you and I can tool around in something like that day more. When that day comes, a day more would be just fine. So long as we have a cooler of beer and some trawling gear so we can go deep sea fishing together, I'll be happy. Ooh, yeah, Dempsey said with a tired smile, and then he turned to go help ready Sarah Bonnie and Diana Curtis for their journey home. 
Chapter 6 Bokharov Creek 2, Sochi, Russia, September 19, 1340, local time. Arkady Zhukov shrugged off his suit coat and folded it over his left forearm while he stood and watched Russian President Vladimir Petrov exercise. Petrov had converted what had probably been a very nice dining lanai into a self-indulgent open-air fitness center. Very expensive-looking exercise contraptions of every shape and size were arranged in a U-shape around a section of padded, open floor space. When the opportunity presented itself, Petrov liked to make a spectacle of his workouts, often inviting guests, VIPs, and even visiting heads of state to join him for a training session. Most refused to participate, but Petrov didn't care. Exercising, per se, was a charade. The point was to create an asymmetry, make his guests uncomfortable, knock the other party off kilter so they became distracted, insecure, or both. No one was immune to the treatment. Once Petrov had insisted Arkady conduct a post-op debrief in a dry sauna, heated to an unbearable 80 degrees Celsius, while Petrov sat naked trimming his toenails. Another time, the president had demanded Arkady accompany him to a hydration therapy session, and he would not let Arkady speak until they were both hooked up to IVs with vitamin-infused saline flowing. It was growing harder and harder to get the Russian president's attention, and the man was taking ever greater pleasure in pushing the boundaries of subservience and sycophancy. The unspoken message was clear. You may be standing beside me, but there is a canyon between us. I'm sweating and I'm not even working out, Arkady said with a chuckle, his second attempt to get Petrov to engage. The Russian president grunted, not in acknowledgment, but from strain. The machine he was presently using, a seated chest press, faced away from Arkady so its user could look out onto the lush and manicured grounds of Bokharov Creek too. Petrov loved Sochi and took every opportunity to govern from his half-billion-dollar summer dacha nestled on the coast of the Black Sea. Arkady recognized the allure. With its mild climate and Russian Riviera aspirations, Sochi glowed with an aura of self-importance, attracting money and power brokers like moths to a flame. But not Arkady. At his core, he was a Muscovite. Strategic briefs somehow didn't feel, well, Russian when conducted on a terrace with the sea breeze blowing in his face. If you prefer, I can come back another time, Arkady said, making a quarter turn to leave. Petrov finished his last rep, arched his back, and shook out his arms at his sides. Then, with a sigh, he climbed off the seat to face Arkady. You should change into a tracksuit and join me, he said with a humorless smile. You could probably use the exercise, old man. I'm retired, Arkady said. Old retired Russians don't exercise. You're not retired, you're just lazy, Arkady. A dozen clever, biting retorts populated Arkady's mind, but he held his tongue. Petrov was in one of his moods, and verbal sparring would only antagonize the Russian president. Petrov had lost his sense of humor years ago, and after all, czars don't self-deprecate. Anyway, I don't think I'll— What do you want, Arkady? Petrov said, cutting him off as he walked to a new machine. Arkady swallowed and forced his cheek muscles to relax. One thing at a time, he reminded himself. With Petrov, it was best to limit each interaction to one topic and one topic only. As of yet, he'd neglected to inform the Russian president that he'd lost six Zeta field operatives to American-led assassinations over the past two months. Now was not the time to break that news. And if he was honest with himself, the window for disclosure of the truth had probably closed. Best case scenario, Petrov would see the repression of the information as a failure of professional judgment. Worst case, he'd view it as treason. In Petrov's mind, all Russian assets, even human ones, belonged to him. All intelligence was his to know. All decisions were his 
to make. In his mind, he was the nexus of all things within and touching the Russian Federation. For Arkady to interfere with or disrupt the flow of information was an unpardonable sin. And so, this morning they would not be discussing Zeta's recent losses in the shadow war raging with Ember. Instead, Arkady would chum the water with much more enticing bait for the great white shark eyeing him from two meters away. There's been an interesting development in Ukraine I wanted to brief you on, the spymaster said. Tell me, Petrov said, adjusting a pin in the weight stack in preparation for his next set. I have a man embedded inside Ultra in Kiev, sowing dissension and stirring up trouble. Typical stuff. Azeta? Yes. Petrov nodded his approval. Remind me, what is this other group, Ultra, you say? They're Ukrainian ultra-right-wing nationalists like National Corps and C-14, only more extreme. In other words, a nuisance, Petrov said, starting a set of seated rows. Why are you wasting my time with this? Because something interesting and unexpected has happened with this group. They're planning to assassinate Ukrainian President Zinovenko. Petrov released the handlebars mid-pull and let the stack of weights slam home with a resounding metallic clang. What? Are you serious? The Arkady said with a nod. Dead serious. Why would they do this? Because they are furious about the Donbass Treaty, they think... By ending the war and giving the separatists in the Donetsk People's Republic autonomy, Zinovenko has betrayed them and betrayed Ukraine. My man has convinced ultra leadership that Zinovenko is weak and that he's a puppet, catering to Western liberalism while at the same time taking Russian bribes. He's promulgating the narrative that the Donbass agreement is only the first step and that Zinovenko plans to cede control of more Ukrainian territory in the coming months. A giddy smile spread across the Russian president's face, the likes of which Arkady had rarely seen. Petrov clapped his hands together and then suddenly did a little celebratory dance to some imaginary party track before saying, "'Glorious! I couldn't make this shit up in my wildest dreams!' "'I know, but wait, there's more.' More, Petrov said, eyes wide with delight. Yes, they are planning the attack when the American vice president arrives to sign the treaty. They want to kill Zinovenko and Tenet at the same time. The smile faded from Petrov's face as the wheels in his head processed this new detail. Vice President Tenet's assassination changed the calculus completely. The stakes, the opportunities, the risk of retribution, the geopolitical aftermath. Hmm, Petrov said and started to pace. What to do, what to do, what to do, Arkady said, vocalizing what they both were thinking. It's a quandary, isn't it? Da, ah, Petrov said, walking to the railing and looking out into the garden. My first inclination is to shut it down, but on the other hand, I know. Your head's in the same place as mine when I got the report. How do they plan to do it? The security is going to be insane. I know these ultra-nationalists are fighters, but short of lending them a squad of Spetsnaz, I don't see how they can pull it off. They stole a javelin missile from the Eastern Front and planned to shoot it from a half kilometer offset, outside the patrol perimeter. This weapon is not like a sniper round or a rocket propelled grenade. It uses a seeker guidance system. It doesn't have to fly a straight trajectory to hit the target. Petrov spun around, the giddy enthusiasm returned to his face. Unbelievable! I love these ultra guys. They've got balls, very big balls. His gaze went to the middle distance while he considered, and then he nodded. Okay, 
I like it, but what is our contribution? Very limited. My man helps them plan the hit and make sure they don't chicken out at the last minute. Good. Most importantly, Ultra takes all the blame. It was their plan. They stole the missile. They take credit for the attack. Petrov nodded, the decision made. Very well, I will send Prime Minister Vavilov to the treaty signing. That way we lose somebody important too. What? Arkady said, a lump suddenly forming in his throat. It's a fair trade. One Russian Prime Minister for one serving Ukrainian president and one future American president. Besides, Russia doesn't need a Prime Minister. He was going to ask Vavilov for his resignation in the coming months anyway. This just accelerates the timeline and gives us ironclad plausible deniability on the world stage. In fact, Petrov stopped mid-sentence. Arkady felt a shift, one that caused goose flesh to stand up on the back of his neck. Go on, he coaxed. I'm getting ahead of myself, Petrov said with a dismissive wave of his hand. We wait and see if the operation is a success before we talk next steps. You have the green light, Arkady. Make it happen. Mr. President, Arkady said a cautious timbre to his voice. Are you sure about Prime Minister Vavilov? I'm certain we could identify another less significant cabinet official to attend. No, Petrov said, his voice a hard line. It has to be Yuri. It should be Yuri. The timing is perfect. Respectfully, I disagree. Vavilov is... Is what? Petrov snapped. An important figurehead who in reality contributes nothing? A politician's politician patiently loitering in my shadow so he can drive a knife in my back when the winds change? Say it, old man. Vavilov is what? I was going to say that Vavilov is a loyal and competent ally. That he has done everything you've asked of him and more while playing his role perfectly without drawing undue attention to himself. He will be a hard man to replace. Were you not listening? Petrov shouted, spittle flying from his lips. I don't need a prime minister. Russia doesn't need a prime minister. Russia needs me. Only me. Forever. Arkady inclined his head. My apologies, Mr. President. You're right, of course. I'll set the operation in motion and keep you updated as things develop. Very well, Petrov said, and walked back to the seated row machine. On your way out, if you see Tatya, send her in with a lemon water. I'm thirsty. Yes, sir, Mr. President, Arkady said, turning to leave. I'll see if I can find her. He walked out of the gym and didn't stop until he reached the Mercedes G-Wagon parked in the drive at the front of the property. The driver, one of Petrov's staff, looked up from his mobile phone when Arkady approached. Airport, Arkady said and let himself into the back seat. The driver nodded, walked around the vehicle and climbed into the driver's seat. Are you in a hurry, sir? he asked, starting the ignition. Niet, Arkady said, propping an elbow on the armrest. There is no need to rush. Was everything okay with your visit? The driver said, glancing at him in the rearview mirror. Everything was perfect, the old spymaster said, looking out the window as they pulled away. But this, of course, was a fiction. Everything was not perfect. Far from it. He pulled out his mobile phone and sent a simple text message to his man in Kiev, confirming the assassination operation was greenlit. Michta. The reply from Gavriil Osinov, the most capable Zeta in his rapidly thinning ranks, came less than a minute later. Probodjitsa? He exhaled audibly and returned his phone to his pocket. With that out of the way, his mind turned to Petrov and the conversation they'd had only moments ago. 
He'd not anticipated the Vavilov move, and he silently cursed himself for not seeing it. Prime Minister Vavilov was an important part of Arkady's endgame. The man was feckless, but the Russian people liked him. Losing Vavilov now would make things much more difficult for Arkady later. Petrov's getting worse. Maybe it's time, Arkady thought, scratching an itch on the side of his neck. No, not yet. Not yet. There's been an attack, Baldwin said. The boss made it out, but the DNI and the Israeli contingent are gone, completely wiped off the face of the earth. The DNI is dead? Dempsey asked, shock settling in. Then he glanced quickly around, glad that only Munn was in earshot and switched into operational mode. Using Phillips's ember call sign, he asked, Do you have positive confirmation that Condor is an angel? No, but there was a pause and then a sigh. The estate is in ruins, John, raised to the ground by an explosion. It seems unlikely there could be any survivors at all. The boss was on scene. Is Eagle hurt? No, he was a safe distance. He and the deputy DNI, Catherine Morgan, are trying to coordinate the casualty response on the ground. Dempsey glanced around, the hair on the back of his neck standing up. Are we secure? Completely, Baldwin said. Get me on with Eagle. Until Annapolis Fire and Rescue arrive, Jarvis is OIC on site. He's unavailable at present, Baldwin said. 
His instructions were to spool the team and prosecute. How long until you can be ready to move? Dempsey glanced back at the bar where he could still hear the howling of his drunken teammates inside. I'm 100% operational, he said. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for the rest of the team. There was a short pause, and then... You're the only one sober, John? Me and Mun. Okay. We don't have a target yet, but we need to get you to moving north as we shrink the uncertainty radius. What about the rest of the team? We need to get them clear. I'll send a car service to pick them up and take them back to the plane. Roger that. He clicked off with a tap on his earpiece, but left the device in his ear. Then he turned to Mun, who was staring at him expectantly. What happened? Dempsey shook his head and started jogging toward the Tahoe. I'll brief you en route, but Dan... Yeah? It's bad, he said solemnly. Time to kid up? Mun asked. Dempsey nodded. Looks like it's you and me tonight. Chapter 6 The Kremlin Office of the President Moscow, Russia June 11th, 1410 Local Time Petrov threw the book at him. Not figuratively, literally. Arkady Zhukov ducked as the latest unflattering hardcover biography written about the Russian president sailed over his head and slammed into the door behind him with a thud. I'm going to fucking kill this guy, Petrov said and began pacing behind his desk. Arkady stooped and picked up the book. The title, Cult of Personality, a profile of Vladimir Petrov, was printed in large block font, superimposed atop an unflattering photograph of the man. An incendiary subtitle read, Strongman, Tactician, or Global Menace, and below that, the author's name, an American Arkady did not recognize. That could probably be arranged, Arkady said, tucking the book under his arm and walking to one of two vacant chairs opposite the president's desk. But we should wait a while until this is forgotten. Not that piece of shit, Petrov said, slamming his fist down on the desk. I'm talking about President Warner. Have you heard the news? You mean the new sanctions levied by Washington to stall the Nord Stream 2 pipeline? Not to stall, to kill, Petrov said, red-faced. He's trying to kill it. Germany won't let that happen. There's too much momentum. First, Warner tried to strong-arm Germany using the media. When that didn't work, he tried to prompt the EU to investigate Gazprom, hoping the EU would view Nord Stream 2 as cementing our unfair monopoly on natural gas. And now that's failed, so he's using sanctions and claiming that Nord Stream 2 is a threat to the stability of NATO. If he can't use the bankers to bully Chancellor Mercer, then he's going to use her generals to do it. At the same time, he's pushing American natural gas exports everywhere he can. The U.S. has a piece of every natural gas terminal under development in Europe. Six are already in the works, and there are talks about six more. Warner needs to go, my friend. It's that simple. He's in his second term, Arkady said, setting the book on the corner of Petrov's desk with practiced nonchalance. He'll be gone in 18 months regardless of what we do. The Americans change leaders like socks. It is one of their weaknesses that we exploit. What we need to be focusing on is who we want to promote as his successor. We're laying the groundwork for the next election cyber campaign right now. I don't like any of the candidates, but one. Petrov sat down, and as he did, his normal coloring returned to his face, the hot anger giving way to his trademark icy malice. Petrov permitted himself to lose his temper only in the company of trusted advisors and members of his innermost circle. 
And then there's Lithuania, Petrov said, either not listening to or not caring about Arkady's conversational lure. What about Lithuania? Their state utility company signed a two-year import agreement with Lone Star Energy out of Texas. The Lithuanian president then signed a $300 million infrastructure improvement bill so they can re-export American gas to Latvia. Poland is building a gas terminal with the same aspirations, and Estonia is working with Finland on the Baltic connector pipeline to cut us out completely. Moscow may be Russia's beating heart, but oil and gas exports are her blood. Our economy cannot survive if we cede our monopoly of the European gas market to foreign powers. Warner knows this, which is why he's hitting us where it hurts. I agree. So what do you want to do about it? Petrov glared at him, apparently not liking the subtext of this comment. Let me rephrase, Arkady said with a deferential smile. What I meant to say is, what do you want me to do about it? I want you to make them all pay. I want you to make them think twice about the next time they try to poke the bear. And I want you to do it in such a way that Russia does not come out looking like we always do, the big bully on the block. A knock sounded on the door to the president's office. Come, barked Petrov. A very tall and very fine-looking young woman entered, carrying a beverage tray. She paused just past the threshold, her body language alone asking the question. Yes, yes, Petrov said, waving her in. Your timing is perfect as always, Tatya. Arkady moved the offensive book from the corner of the president's desk to make room, and Tatya set the tray in that exact spot. Tea, the way that you like it, Mr. President, and coffee for you, Minister Arkady. Arkady smiled at her. He hated tea. Ah, you remembered. Thank you. She nodded at him with a little look that said, Of course I remembered. You think this is all I'm capable of? Then she turned to Petrov. Is there anything else, Mr. President? No, not now, Petrov said, staring at her with equal parts judgment and lust. She nodded, turned, and let herself out. Arkady raised his eyebrows at Petrov once the door was shut. Of course I am, the president said, while taking zero pleasure in the gloating. That is when you know a man has no soul left, Arkady thought, studying Petrov's eyes. There's no pleasure left in life that sates him. He is a fire in a freezer, burning and consuming, yet providing no heat or light. What? Petrov snapped. Why are you looking at me that way? I have an idea, Arkady said, rubbing his chin. As you know, Lithuania's entire natural gas operation is dependent upon the FSRU independence at the port in Klaipeda. This one ship is everything, floating storage and regasification unit. It's quite brilliant, actually. All a country needs is a pier and voila, instant LNG terminal. Carrier ships moor alongside the independence, which receives liquefied natural gas, then evaporates it to its original form and supplies it to the main transmission system for distribution to the rest of the country. I'm not an idiot, Arkady, Petrov said through a sigh. Take out the independence and you take out Lithuania's entire ability to import gas. The spymaster nodded. That's right. I assume you're proposing a false flag terrorist operation? Make it look like jihadists have attacked the independence for reasons of their own? No. I think this time we go small, 
industrial sabotage made to look like equipment failure, followed by human error leading to the sinking of the vessel at the pier. Petrov nodded. If you sink it, it can be repaired. Why not blow it up? Da, it could be repaired, but at what cost? On what timeline? If we do this properly, the rehabilitation cost might exceed the cost of replacement. And remember, the independence is being leased from the Swedes. Just think about this circus. Once the lawyers get involved, it will take a year minimum, maybe longer. And it will be an environmental nightmare. There's a good chance when this is all over, Klepida as a natural gas import terminal will be done forever. Petrov nodded but said nothing, so Arkady kept talking, kept selling. In the beginning, right after the accident, Russia will step in and offer a new one-year emergency supply contract with Gazprom to help the Lithuanians deal with this terrible crisis. Gazprom agrees to lock in the price at a favorable rate, and Russia looks like the hero to the rescue. Yes. I like this, said Petrov. We can even offer technical support and equipment to help with the cleanup. Better yet, we help with the investigation. We can send engineers, divers, system experts from Gazprom and the Russian Navy to help find the cause of the accident. Exactly, Arkady said. Okay, you have the green light, but don't fuck this up, Arkady. The Americans know it was us behind the assassination attempt in Turkey. That's why Warner is throwing everything he has at taking Russia down while he's still in power. There can be no traces back to us. Understood, Mr. President, he said, showing the deference Petrov craved. Is that all you have for me? Petrov asked. It wasn't all he had, not by a mile. There was the incident in Narva he'd purposely neglected to share, and there was the ever-growing paranoia he felt that the Americans were closing in on Spetsgruppa Zeta, the ultra-secret task force he commanded. In his last communication with Catherine Morgan, she'd assured him that neither DNI Jarvis nor Task Force Ember had pierced Malik's legend. More important, Arkady himself was still completely off their radars as they prowled for clues as to who had conducted the attacks in Turkey. But Ember? They were tenacious, smart, nearly as much so as Zeta and operated with a virtually unlimited budget. It was only a matter of time before they came knocking on his door, something he needed to preemptively circumvent. Even now he was moving chess pieces on American soil. When the time came, he, not Kelso Jarvis, would have the assets in position to deliver a death strike. Only one king could rule the board, and that king was him. Arkady met Petrov's blue-eyed gaze. I have nothing else, Mr. President. Very well, Petrov said, signaling that the meeting was over. Arkady drained the remainder of his coffee, stood, and tucking the biography under his arm, turned to leave. I thought, Petrov tisked, that's my book. Oh, my apologies. I thought when you threw it at me, it was meant to be a gift, Arkady said with a brother's smile. It's autographed, Petrov said with a fox's smile. It goes on the shelf with the others, Arkady chuckled and handed it back to the man he both loved and despised, a product of his tutelage and the worst and best thing to ever happen to Russia. As the book changed hands, Arkady's gaze lingered on the subtitle, Strongman, Tactician, or Global Menace? The answer was all three, of course. 
something everyone knew, including the man behind the desk. Chapter 6 Lucy Kim's apartment, corner of Acacia Grove and Arcadia Mews, half-block west of High Street, New Malden, United Kingdom, day 2, 12.35 local time. Do a sound check, Whitney said from behind her laptop as Lucy adjusted her necklace. The pendant the MI6 agent runner was wearing had a noise-canceling mic and high-res camera concealed inside. Gone were the days of body wires and bulky transmitter packs. This little gem linked wirelessly to Lucy's phone via Bluetooth. Comms check one, two, three, the Brit said. Whitney heard the transmission loud and clear in her headset. The slick little MI6 application she ran on her computer automatically recorded separate video and audio tracks with timestamps and displayed a running graph of signal strength, recording decibel level and background noise. Comms checks at, Whitney said. Are you sure you don't want to wear an earbud? There's no way for me to talk to you using this setup. Don't need it, Lucy said dismissively. I'm in no danger, and the last thing I want to do is spook her, which could happen if she noticed I was wearing an earbud. What if there's a problem? Then text me. All right, Whitney said with a close-lipped smile. Good luck. Thanks, the MI6 agent runner said as she headed to the apartment door. Help yourself to whatever you want in the fridge. You can eat all the leftover takeaway from last night. Roger that, Whitney said, slipping into her talk persona, even though for today's op she'd be little more than a fly on the wall. And yet, despite that, she still had pre-op butterflies in her stomach. Not for herself, but for Lucy. The more time she'd spent with her British counterpart, the more she liked the woman and wanted her to succeed. Whitney had never actually recruited an asset, and she was excited to see Kim in action. Agent Runner was the MI6 equivalent to what the CIA would call an asset handler. There was an art to recruiting assets, and a tremendous upfront personal time commitment required. Over dinner last night, Lucy had explained that she'd been fostering a relationship with Deba for months, and how difficult it had been to get Nadar's wife to trust her and open up. Finding a way to break that trust without imploding the relationship was the trick to a successful recruitment, Lucy had explained. The more you and the asset were invested in each other, the more the reveal would feel like a betrayal. After the betrayal, the recruiter had a finite window to make her case for why her dishonesty was the lesser of two evils, the more damning option being to do nothing. When Whitney had asked if there was a standardized playbook for how the dance was done, Lucy had laughed. It'd be bloody helpful if there was, but unfortunately every person is different, so you have to customize the approach as you go along, Lucy had said. But there is one thing I think is true no matter who it is you're recruiting. And what's that? They need to believe you're doing it for them as much as you're doing it for yourself. Nobody likes the feeling of being used. Those words echoed in her head as she watched the live camera feed from Lucy's pendant while the MI6 officer walked down High Street. Nobody likes the feeling of being used. There was nuance in that statement. A potentially profound nuance, she realized. People use and get used by other people every day. How the experience felt, however, was the differentiator. Sending the intern on a Starbucks run was hardly a soul-sullying experience, but building a fake friendship for months to spy on another woman's husband? That was an entirely different level of exploitation. She was curious to see how Lucy accounted for Deba's feelings as she navigated the reveal. According to Lucy, Kasim Nadar kept a reliable daily work schedule. He rarely came home early and never had lunch out with his wife, despite his flat in the office being within walking distance of numerous restaurants. He did eat out with colleagues occasionally, but Lucy had timed her lunch with Deba on the later side to preclude that complication. Also, they were meeting at Imone, an authentic Korean eatery, 
a place she said she'd bet her left thumb Kasim would never patronize. Lucy arrived first as planned and was quickly seated. The restaurant didn't appear crowded, and listening from Lucy's flat, Whitney zoned out while Lucy chatted with the owner in Korean until Deba arrived. When she did, Lucy stood and greeted Deba with a hug. The Afghan woman did not look like Whitney expected. Short, stylish, and buxom. She wore a fashionable maternity dress and color-coordinated silk headscarf. What did you expect, Whit, for her to show up in a blue burqa? Deba seemed completely at ease, laughing often and easily as the two women made small talk. The pendant camera had a wide-angle lens, so no matter how Lucy moved or turned, Deba was almost always in frame. When it was time to order, Lucy talked Deba through the menu and helped her make up her mind. Whitney had never actually tried Korean food, so none of the menu item names meant anything to her. After the order was in, the two women sipped hot tea and continued to talk, mostly about Deba's pregnancy. To Whitney's surprise, she found herself immersed in their conversation, fully engaged and laughing along. After something interesting Lucy said, she even opened her mouth to chime in as if she was on a Zoom call with friends. Maybe it was a product of all the video conferences she'd been having lately, or maybe it was a symptom of something else something she was missing. Female companionship, maybe? Sure, she had Chief Petty Officer Yi, and thank God for that, but she didn't have this in her life. She didn't have a best girlfriend to go to lunches with, or to meet after work for drinks, or to casually hang out with on the sofa and get carry out, like she'd done last night in Lucy's flat. What do I have? A bunch of tobacco-dipping, ass-grabbing, rifle-shooting rednecks who call me heels and make fun of me because I can't run five miles without puking. Certainly nobody to talk baby stuff with. But why did that suddenly bother her? She'd staunchly resisted flirting with motherhood, even the possibility of it, for as long as she could remember. She didn't know how it was for other women, but for her, the strange and miraculous ability she possessed to make another human being inside her body felt like a superpower. But like the superhero mantra goes, with great power comes great responsibility. And she certainly was not ready for the responsibility of becoming a mother. She'd never vocalized her misgivings on the matter, but her current opinion was that she wasn't emotionally, professionally, or intellectually ready for motherhood. And yet, looking at Deba, her smile, her joy, her certitude... A little voice in Whitney's head asked an unprompted and terrifying question. Why not? She shook her head. No, just stop. You chose this life. Did you like it? Lucy was saying as their plates were being taken away by the server. Oh, yes, Diba said. Different, but very good. I should like to come here again. Great, me too, Lucy said but Whitney could feel the unspoken heaviness in her voice. The time was now. Lucy was about to jump the chasm of no return. The camera panned as Lucy turned in her seat, probably checking to make sure no one was close enough to hear what she said next. Deba, there's something important I need to talk to you about, Lucy said. Whitney watched the contented expression of a woman sated after a nice lunch disappear and morph into one of concern. Is everything all right? Diba asked. She heard a shaky exhale from Lucy. The MI6 officer's heart was pounding so hard against her breastbone, the pendant mic picked it up. Diba, I have not been... Entirely honest with you about something. Deba went rigid. Okay. I work the register and tables at Nando's, but that's not my real job. In reality, I work for the British government, Lucy said, leaning in. And my job is to look after and protect you. Whitney watched all the color drain from Deba's face. What are you talking about? 
Deba said, her eyes betraying her internal panic. Protect me from what? From your husband and the dangerous people he works with, Lucy said, her voice velvet now as she gained control of her nerves. What are you talking about? Deba said again, this time with a little less conviction. Whitney could practically see the gears turning in the Afghan woman's mind as she ran through scenarios, probably planned but not adequately rehearsed. Deba, we both know that Kasim is leading two lives. One in public as a respectable aerospace engineer and upstanding British citizen, and another in secret as a member of the terrorist group al qaeda where he helps support global jihad through finance and technology transfer. No, this is a lie, Deba said, shaking her head. A filthy, dirty lie. You're doing this because we're Muslim, because we're immigrants. He told me this would happen. He told me I don't have to answer your questions. I'm going to leave now. Deba, hear me out first, please. Then if you want to go, you can go. Lucy said with just enough authority that Deba, who had scooted her chair back from the table, remained in her seat. Listen. I know you're scared. I know that it's confusing and upsetting how I've confronted you about this, but the alternative, which is me doing nothing, is much, much worse. My name is Lucy Kim, and I'm first-generation British-born Korean. My parents are immigrants, too. We are not having this conversation because you are Muslim or because you are an immigrant. We're having this conversation because your husband's choices have put you and your son in grave danger. My number one priority is to protect you. Whitney found herself nodding along as Lucy made her case. Damn, the girl is good. So what are you telling me? Deba said, both her voice and her expression wooden. That you work for British intelligence and you want me to spy on my husband for you? No, Lucy said. What I'm telling you is that I am your friend and a resource for you. If you are scared, if you are looking for a way out, you can talk to me. You can trust me. Trust you, Deba said with a laugh. That is funny, since you have lied to me since the day we met. You're not my friend. You're trying to recruit me. I'm new to this country and this language, but I watch Killing Eve. I know how this game is working. It's not like the TV shows, Lucy said. I get to choose who I support and how. This is a risk for me, too. I'm putting my reputation and my neck on the line for you. I don't have to do it, you know. When Kasim goes down, you'll go down with him. Do you want to give birth to your son in a terrorist detention cell? Or maybe the judge won't bother incarcerating you. They'll just deport you back to Afghanistan. But the Afghanistan they send you back to is not the same one that you left. The Taliban is in control now. How do you think you'll be received? What future lies in wait for you and your son under Taliban rule? Your life, your son's life? These are the things I'm concerned about. I promise you, Deba, I'm offering you not only protection from Qasim and al qaeda but also from the Taliban. If you choose me, I can guarantee that you can remain here in the United Kingdom and your son can grow up as a British citizen. Deba said nothing for a long time as she processed a possible future that, from the look on her face, she'd not considered. When she finally spoke, she stood and said, My husband would never hurt me or my son. Deba, wait, Lucy called, standing up but not making a move to follow Deba out the door. All things considered, I think that went pretty well, Whitney said, but then chuckled because, duh, Lucy couldn't hear her. Bollocks, Lucy said, and Whitney could hear the defeated sigh that followed. Whitney grabbed her mobile phone and texted Lucy a few words of encouragement, to which the MI6 agent runner replied verbally with a wistful, I don't know. 
I thought for a minute I had her. Whitney thumb-typed her reply. Come back to the flat and we can talk about it. If there's one thing I've learned in this job is that it's not over until it's over, and this is definitely far from over. She looked over her reply and hit send. Then, glancing around the chaos of the small apartment and the stack of dirty dishes in the sink, added, And bring me something to eat. I'm famished.
I don't like it, Land said, shaking his head. I ain't squeezing through that gap, one of the other SWAT guys said. Ain't no fucking way. If those doors decide to go shut, I'm gonna get squashed like a grape. Garrett, this is Marx. Do you copy? Garrett, do you copy? Damn it, he's gone. She cursed and looked to Land. What did he say before you lost him? Land asked. He said Charlie will permit me and me alone to enter, she said, pursing her lips in aggravation. Who the hell is Charlie? The SWAT leader asked. Land ignored the question and scanned the walls and ceiling around the ramp. Then he pointed to two surveillance cameras, one mounted on each side of the chute at head level. Sergeant Baker, Land said to the SWAT team leader. Can you take out those cameras, please? Gladly, Baker said with a grin. And he and one of the other operators used the butt stocks of their assault rifles to smash the wall-mounted cameras to smithereens. When they were finished, Land said, There, what Charlie can't see, Charlie doesn't know. I'll go first, Land said. But when he walked up to the massive doors, he paused before the gap. With a wary expression, he turned to look at her. Then, stealing himself with a deep breath, he turned sideways and, Stop, Valerie blurted. It's too dangerous. He said just me, I'll go alone. At this, a wry smile crept across Land's face. We're partners, Marx, and partners have each other's backs. Wherever you go, I go. And with that, he sucked in his gut and squeezed his barrel chest into the gap between the steel doors. Chapter 28 The Tunnel I'm all right, Marx. Land called. You can open your eyes now. Valerie, who hadn't realized she'd shut them, opened her eyes to see a grinning Land staring at her from the other side of the gap. We should hurry, Winter said in her ear. Charlie won't leave this door open forever. Agreed. Let's go, fellas, she hollered at the SWAT team. Everyone's through. I'll go last in case we missed a camera and he's still watching. Winter, you go next. Winter nodded, and with feline grace, quickly slipped through the gap. The SWAT shooters looked at one another, then turned to the team leader. You heard the lady, let's go, Baker barked. Fuck it, one of the assaulters said and squeezed through the gap, followed a second later by another. From the other side, Len gestured for them to hurry. No way, Sarge, the youngest kitted up SWAT shooter said. I ain't fucking going. You're going, and that's an order, Baker said, shoving the young man toward the gap. Come on, son, you can do it, Land encouraged from the other side. Go now, the SWAT leader commanded. Red-faced, the young assaulter shimmied through the gap with gritted teeth, and then exhaled with audible relief on the other side. After you, ma'am, the SWAT leader said. I should go last, she countered. The door suddenly shuddered, driving shut for a split second, and narrowing the gap an inch. Marx, get your insubordinate ass over here, Land barked. If you don't make it through, this is all for nothing. She stepped up to the gap, then turned back to look at the SWAT team leader. He nodded. She blew air through pursed lips, and then sidestepped through the gap as fast as she could. With only a split second delay, the SWAT leader tried to follow her through the gap, but the doors began to move. No, Valerie screamed as the doors scissored shut on the man. He jerked his torso backward out of the gap, but his leading foot and hand were not so lucky. The round toe of his boot was spat back out like a watermelon seed, but the four fingers on his gloved hand did not fare as well. The heavy doors snapped closed with a metallic crash, locking into place. Four fingers, still inside their green finger glove cocoons, fell to the floor in a little pile, spattering red blood onto the smooth white tile floor. Oh shit, one of the SWAT men shouted and stepped back in revulsion. On the other side, Valerie heard a muffled howl of agony. Then the pounding began. The SWAT officer to Valerie's left squatted and scooped the little green and blood red sausages into a bandana. They can reattach those, right? the young shooter said, as all the color drained from his face. Somebody catch him, 
Valerie said as the young operator began to teeter. Land, moving like a flash of lightning, was behind the young man to catch him under the armpits before his limp body hit the ground. We gotta get these fucking doors open, cried the man holding the bandana with Baker's fingers. Damn it, Charlie, enough with the mind games, open the fucking doors, Valerie shouted, whirling in a circle and looking for a ceiling camera or speaker to direct her fury at. But she was met with only silence. Baker, this is Sergeant Land, do you copy? He said, trying his tactical radio. After a long pause and no response, Land switched channels. Henrico Incident Command, do you copy? You won't get any reception down here. Winter said. The tunnel and testing facility are underground and heavily reinforced to contain any accidents or untoward events. The walls and even these doors are lined with lead. Valerie shuddered to think what that might mean, and for the first time since crossing the threshold, took stock of her surroundings. The tunnel, as Winter had dubbed it, stood in stark contrast to the eye catching, innovative architecture of the lobby. There was no variation in either shape or color here. The rectangular white walls were only barely distinguishable from the white floor and white ceiling. Soft, diffuse lighting made it hard to appreciate the dimensions of the space. In fact, she saw no light fixtures at all, and only then deduced that the entire tunnel was backlit from behind massive frosted acrylic panels, encapsulating them on all four sides. What's the purpose of this? Valerie asked Winter gesturing to the tunnel itself. This passageway is the primary access to platform robotics, the R&D proving grounds, the building's mechanical systems, the security control room, and other sensitive areas. Access to the underground levels requires a special platform security designation, and most of the employees who work down here have government security clearance as well. The unique design of the tunnel was entirely Britt's idea. He wanted it to feel like crossing from one dimension into another. Also, the engineering makes it virtually impossible to smuggle unauthorized material into or out of the underground laboratories and testing facilities. He would not believe the myriad of scanning technologies hidden behind the wall, floor, and ceiling panels in this tunnel. She added this disturbing revelation to her ever-growing list of concerns about this mission. And then, with beseeching eyes, said, Dr. Winter, can you open those doors? Team Leader Baker desperately needs us. I wish I could, he said. But my access rights and security clearance were stripped the day I left the company. Besides, Charlie is in control now. What do we do? She asked Land. We carry out our mission, the former Marine said, setting his jaw. Our objective is to reclaim control of this building, which means reaching Garrett in the control room. Land turned and looked at the three SWAT team members. The youngest team member, the one who'd fainted, now sat with his head between his knees and his back against the tunnel wall. Land gestured to the guy who held the bloody bandana with Baker's fingers. Give the kid the bandana. He stays. You and... He gestured to the second shooter. Jones, said the other officer, stepping up. You and Jones are coming with us. Marks and Jones at the rear. Dr. Winter, you'll be in the middle, okay? Winter nodded. Understood. Land gestured to the first shooter. You're with me. We're taking point. Roger that, Sergeant, the man said. What's at the end of this tunnel? Land asked Winter. Elevator bank and a stairwell, Winter replied. Land looked at the young SWAT shooter who was staying behind. What about me? The kid asked. What are my orders? When Major Cooley's people eventually get those security doors open, you let them know we're down below. The plan is to commence a hard target search on U-1 and work our way down to U-2 and eventually U-3. The young man nodded. Good luck, he said, clutching the bandana against his chest but not looking at it. Chopping a hand down the hall, Land slipped fully into his gunnery sergeant marine persona and barked, Move out. Chapter 29 Valerie had to concentrate on each footfall as they walked the tunnel. The eerie, diffuse backlighting and zero contrast surfaces gave her vertigo the likes of which she'd never experienced. 
Winter had said the tunnel walk was intended to feel like crossing dimensions, but she felt like she was moving through a sensory deprivation tank. Is it just me, or is everybody else waiting for some hidden defense system to fire up and cut us all to ribbons? The SWAT officer beside Valerie said. Yeah, man. This tunnel reminds me of that scene in Resident Evil, when the clueless tactical team gets sliced into cubes by the laser grid. The lead shooter answered. There are no lasers, gentlemen, Winter said definitively. I promise. The end of the tunnel created another visual illusion, as it formed a T-junction that was not perceptible until reaching the end of the passage. On their right was a single large elevator, the inset polished steel door a jarring contrast in the sea of white. On their left was a matching polished steel manual door, with a bright silver handle leading to a stairwell. Elevator or stairs? Land asked over his shoulder. After what just happened back there with Baker, I vote stairs. Charlie is undoubtedly in control of the elevator, Valerie said. The stairwell meets building codes for fire escapes, Winter said. The doors cannot be locked. All right, we take the stairs, Land said. Then, turning to Winter, he asked, Where are we going? Garrett is in central control on U1, down one level. It's the first room in the corridor, 20 feet from the elevator, if that. Okay, we start there. Listen up, everyone. Just because we've not encountered any armed threats doesn't mean we won't, Land said, asserting himself as the team leader. Stay frosty and clear your corners. Got it? He got acknowledgments from everyone, then pulled open the stairwell door. Valerie's heart rate picked up, and her muscles tensed as she remembered the last time she'd cleared a stairwell at Platform Cognition, and the bloody aftermath that followed. She pushed the gruesome imagery from her mind and focused on her breathing. The lead SWAT operator entered the stairwell in a tactical crouch, sighting over his rifle. Land went second, followed by Valerie, then Winter, and finally Jones bringing up the rear. Unlike the otherworldly tunnel, the stairwell was a standard-issue fire escape, with painted concrete walls, bare concrete steps, and yellow, tubular steel railings. The SWAT officer in the lead expertly cleared the landings and the drop as they descended. He paused at the U-1 landing until the rest of the party made ready behind him. Then, on land's silent three-count, he quietly pushed open the door. The SWAT shooter went right, disappearing from view as land exited quickly, clearing left. Jones stepped up and followed Land, with Valerie moving in behind him to back up the first SWAT shooter clearing right. She slid in behind Jones, tapping him twice on the right shoulder to announce her position as they advanced as a pair to clear the rear corner. The corridor stood deserted in both directions. Clear, Land announced. On that signal, Winter followed them out of the stairwell. The design aesthetic on U1 was a toned-down, pragmatic variant of what she'd seen in the tunnel. White walls and ceiling, but constructed from conventional materials with subdued and diffuse lighting, supplied by square LED panels in the ceiling. A concrete floor, painted gray with multicolored stripes running together, stretched like a rainbow down the hall. Across the hall, a mirrored window marked what she assumed to be the security center. Valerie and her SWAT team member, rejoined Land and Jones in the middle of the corridor. No one said anything as each of them individually looked around the silent hallway, scanning for threats. Land fixed his gaze on the windowless door next to the mirrored window. The door, set in an almost invisible frame, had no handle. Beside it, a flat security panel of dark green glass and a stainless steel frame was mounted to the wall. I presume that's central control, Land asked with a sideways glance at Winter. The billionaire scientist nodded. I'd say try the handle and see if it's locked, Land said, walking up to the door. But that's a non-starter because there is no handle. He pushed on the slab, but it didn't budge. Valerie stepped up beside him and studied what she surmised was the room's security access panel. Green and red oblong buttons glowed in black strips beneath the green glass panel, which on closer inspection had the faint outline of a human right hand etched into it. The green button glowed brightly, backlit by an LED. With a shrug, she pressed it. A soft click followed, and the door swung open on its own. 
She looked at Land. Well, that was easy. Land frowned, no doubt thinking, like her, that it may have been too easy, and followed her inside. Clear, he said to her left as she scanned over her Glock. Clear, she echoed, and lowered her weapon. The control panel terminals and monitor banks were powered on, but no one manned the controls. A navy blue jacket with an embroidered platform cognition security patch on the left shoulder hung limply on the back of a swivel chair. An open styrofoam box with what appeared to be a half-eaten breakfast of scrambled eggs, sausage links, and toast sat on the control panel work surface. Land stepped into Valerie's field of vision, picking up a coffee tumbler next to the food container. Still warm, he said. Valerie stepped around him and picked up a pen resting on a pad of paper beside a keyboard. She held it up for inspection and read the embossed print. DARPA, D60 Symposium. Garrett was definitely here, she said. How do you know? Land asked. This has got to be his pen, she said, handing it to Land. As if of the same mind, they both leaned in to survey the live security camera feed streaming on a bank of 24 monitors arranged in three rows of eight screens above a pair of workstations. Half the screens were dark, and the others showed various rooms, each labeled with a descriptor, all apparently unoccupied. All right, Winter, Land said, irritation creeping into his voice for the first time. What the hell is going on here? Where in God's name is everyone? Where are the hostages? I don't know, Sergeant, Winter said, walking up to join them, his voice neither apologetic nor defensive. But I echo your concern. This feels... wrong. Marks, Land snapped, turning to her. What exactly did Garrett tell you? I'm having trouble building a tactical picture here. We came down here to find and rescue hostages supposedly trapped by the damn AI. Where are the damn hostages, he said, thrusting a hand at the monitors like a trial lawyer showing the jury an exhibit. He just said Charlie had trapped hostages in various rooms, and he was worried about Charlie using things like the HVAC system to impact air supply or temperature to jeopardize their safety. Maybe the hostages are in the rooms with the dark monitors, Winter said. Maybe Charlie cut the security feeds to those spaces so we can't see what's happening. But why do that, Valerie said. He left the door unlocked for us. If he wanted to make things difficult, why give us access to the control room at all? Because he's fucking with us, Land said through a growl. Valerie looked at the former Marine. Apparently her boss had finally accepted that Charlie was responsible for what was happening. Agreed, Winter said. But Charlie doesn't do random. He has objectives and he has a plan. There are no accidents, no coincidences. Everything he shows us has a purpose. He wants us to check those rooms, Land said, staring at the dark monitors and rubbing his chin. Valerie nodded. Yeah, it's a game. We are the rats and this is his maze. So what do we do? Land said, talking more to himself than the group now. We could refuse to play, we could just leave. There has to be another way out. You can't have a single entrance and egress to an underground facility like this. There's another exit on the opposite side, but we could get there and find it secured as well, Winter said. And we can't leave the hostages behind, Valerie added. If it's not us, somebody will have to rescue them. Okay, well, look here, Land said, gesturing to the dark monitors. There are labels for these rooms, at least. This one says lounge, which I assume is the employee lounge. Do you know where that is? Yeah, it's on this level, halfway down the corridor on the right, Winter said. Okay, Land said, pointing to the next monitor. What's that? That's medical suite number one. It's at the end of the hall. Medical space? Valerie asked. Like a clinic for employees? No, Winter said, swiveling to face her. We have a medical urgent care center on site, but it's in the main building on the second floor. This is a medical products research lab. 
We have a medical platform AI that designs surgical and diagnostic tools, sensors, and appendages to revolutionize robotic surgery. It's like the Da Vinci surgical robot, but with critical thinking and decision-making abilities. Well, that's scary as shit, Land said. Winter shrugged. I don't know about that. The surgical robotics suite, coupled with AI, puts every bit of scientific writing and research at the surgeon's fingertips. Imagine the utility in space exploration or out at sea, for example. Scary as shit, Land repeated. Especially if everything the two of you have told me about Charlie is true. That's fair, Winter said, nodding. But not all AI is insidious or dangerous. Properly implemented, artificial intelligence will produce advances across all the life sciences. AI will revolutionize medicine, exponentially developing new life-saving techniques, new life-altering technology, and changing the way we diagnose and treat disease. AI will save millions of lives each year. If artificial intelligence is so great, Land said, then why do you and your ram friends want so desperately to shut it all down? Have you already forgotten about your acolyte Kimberly Knowles and the carnage she unleashed here? Winter closed his eyes momentarily in frustration. It's not a binary problem, Sergeant. As someone with obvious leadership experience, I know you understand that. I'm not advocating against AI. I've dedicated my adult life to the study and development of machine learning and artificial intelligence platforms. But there are two very different categories of AI. The first is highly specialized, narrow AI, and the other is general purpose AI. The former is what platform cognition was founded upon. The platforms are self-improving, but they're not sentient. Project Nomad was our first foray into general purpose AI. We produced a self-aware, sentient, evolving machine intelligence that has proven itself to be both unpredictable and dangerous. As for Ram and Kimberly Knowles, Winter paused, reining in his building anger. RAM is not a violent organization. It was founded as an activist group to bring awareness to the potential dangers of artificial intelligence developed without oversight, as well as weaponized AI being developed for the military applications your friend Heath Garrett loves so much. As for Kimberly Knowles, she was not my acolyte. She was a very intelligent, very troubled young woman with first-hand exposure to the inherent dangers of Project Nomad. All I know, Land said as he handed Winter his tactical radio, is your creation has killed a lot of people, and it's entirely up to us to stop it. On that point, Sergeant, we are in complete agreement. Land turned to Jones and wordlessly extended his hand. The SWAT officer nodded and passed Land his own radio. Test, test, Land said, depressing the radio transmit button on the side of the brick. She heard his voice, slightly out of sync, in her left ear and also from the speaker on the radio in Winter's hand. Okay, so we have local comms down here, but we should assume the range will be short without a repeater. Dr. Winter, are you comfortable staying here, watching these monitors as our eyes and ears, and directing us room by room? Winter nodded. I can do that. Len turned to the two SWAT operators and said, Two-man teams to get it done quickly? They nodded. But tight proximity, never more than one room apart, okay? Check, Valerie said in unison with the SWAT guys, almost unconsciously adding, Gunny. Land moved to the doorway, but paused at the threshold to look at Winter. Employee lounge is the first dark room, correct? Correct, Winter said. Third door down on the right. All right, let's go, people, Land said and stepped out into the corridor with Valerie in trail. They didn't make it three paces when Land raised his left hand in a closed fist and froze the group. Down the hall, Valerie saw a stationary something looking at them. What the fuck is that? Jones said, taking aim with his assault rifle. Valerie blinked as if trying to clear a hallucination. Thirty yards away stood something black and barrel-chested, the size of a very large dog, like a bull mastiff, but with thin, tapered legs that could have belonged to a deer. 
and the place where a head should be was an articulating arm and mechanical claw. The legs suddenly shuffled in place, and the mechanical claw rapidly opened and closed its jaws, chittering at them. Jones opened fire. The roar of his rifle reverberated down the corridor as muzzle flashes strobed in Valerie's peripheral vision. An instant later, the other SWAT member engaged, firing multiple three-round bursts at it. The creature, or whatever it was, had dropped the ground, folding its legs underneath its body, while tucking the claw head behind its torso out of the line of fire. Whoa, 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 Lance shouted over the din. Hold fire, hold fire! The two SWAT shooters ceased fire in unison, and the only sound in the corridor was the ting of brass casings bouncing off the concrete floor. I think you killed it, fellas, Lance said, the right corner of his mouth curling into the beginning of a grin. Seriously, what the hell is that thing? Jones said, still sighting over his rifle. That is a bark, said Winter's voice behind them as he stepped into the hallway which stands for battery-powered autonomous robotic quadruped. And it appears they've made it bulletproof in my absence. Valerie watched as the bark got to its feet. It cocked its claw head at them like a curious dog, then trotted out of view around the corner at the end of the corridor. Seriously, Winter, Lance said over the radio. Forget the acronym, what is that thing? A multi-purpose utility robot, Winter said calmly. It's not a threat. Then why is it bulletproof? Valerie asked. As I insinuated before, because of people like Mr. Garrett from the Pentagon, Winter said with a scowl. My God, they're creepy. Why'd you make them look like that? Jones asked. Quadrupeds are stable. They maneuver easily, resist falling over, can traverse uneven terrain, climb stairs, carry weight. They have all the same utility of a pack animal or a working dog, except they don't require care or sustenance, Winter explained. Is that thing going to be a problem for us, Dr. Winter? Land asked. I hope not, Winter replied. I'm surprised to see one on this level. They usually stick to you three. They, Land said, cocking an eyebrow. You mean there's more of those things? Yes. How many more? Winter grimaced. How many? Land repeated, his expression suddenly grave. I don't know. When I left, we had a half dozen working prototypes, but the number could be double that now. It all depends on funding. I really have no idea. Should have brought grenades, Jones said, shaking his head. It's just a metal dog, bro, the other SWAT officer said. Grenades might be overkill. I'm serious. Jones said. We unloaded at least two dozen rounds on that thing, and it got up and walked away like nothing happened. If it attacks, we can't stop it. Valerie turned to Winter. How many rooms do we need to check on this level? Three. All right, Land said. We attempt to clear these three, then we regroup and plan our next move. Winter, back to your post. Winter nodded and disappeared back into the security center. The first room to clear is the employee lounge on the right, came Winter's voice on the radio. Check, said Land, leading their four-person team down the hall. When they reached the employee lounge, Land raised a closed fist. They all stopped. A split second later, Valerie heard a click. What was that? Jones asked. Sounded like it came from the door, the other SWAT operator said, aiming his rifle at the slab. Guys, you're not going to believe this, came Winter's voice on the radio. But somebody just unlocked the door to the lounge. By somebody, you mean Charlie, right? Valerie asked. Well, yeah, probably. This is a freak show. It's a fucking freak show, Jones murmured under his breath. Secure that shit, Land barked. When it was quiet, he turned to the other SWAT shooter. We go on three. I'll clear right, you clear left. Check. Land pushed the door open and advanced into the employee lounge. Valerie stayed behind in the hall with Jones, her pulse pounding loudly in her ears. Clear, came Land's voice a beat later. Clear, came the report from the other SWAT operator. Empty, 
Lan said, appearing in the doorway. Not a soul inside, but it looks like people were here recently. There's unfinished snacks and drinks, a computer on the table, that sort of thing. Damn, Valerie said through a breath. Next room, Land asked over the radio. Training room two, Winter said. Four doors down on the left, past the lounge. Valerie heard a distinct but distant click. Winter, this is Marks. Was that click I just heard what I think it was? That's affirmative. Charlie just unlocked training room two. An instant later, she heard a second click. He just unlocked the third room, med suite number one, which is directly opposite the training room, on the right side of the corridor, came Winter's update. Marks, you and Jones take the medical suite. We'll clear training room two, Len said. Roger that, she replied, and looked over at Jones. I'm good. We're good, he said. They advanced as a unit until they reached the target rooms. Land gave Valerie a nod, and the two teams of two turned abreast of each other to enter and search their respective rooms. Valerie executed a silent three count, nodding her head in time for Jones, then pulled her door open and moved into the room in a combat crouch, scanning over her Glock as she cleared left, and Jones cleared the right rear corner. Finding no threats, she turned to the middle, Jones mirroring her movements to her right. To her surprise, she saw two additional rooms in front of them. The room they stood in looked like a pre-surgical staging area. And through two open doors, she saw what looked like twin operating rooms, each complete with a surgical table and instruments opened on a stand beside it, an anesthesia machine, a bank of monitors at the head of the table, and two stools. A large metal box hung ominously above the table, eerily similar in design to the one over the kitchen island at the Norris estate. Beyond the operating table was a long, rectangular window that looked like the front of a control booth. The lights were on inside, but she saw no movement through the glass. I'll take the one on the left, you take the one on the right, she said, taking the lead. Check, Jones said. Training room is clear. We're coming to you, Marks, Lan said in her ear. We're fine, she said, with more irritation than she meant. Med suite is empty. We're out in ten seconds, just one more bay to clear. She crossed the threshold and stepped into the first operating room. Peering over her Glock, a wave of inexplicable anticipation washed over her. An image of Heath Garrett lying in a puddle of blood on the floor on the other side of the operating table flashed before her mind's eye. A monitor mounted on a metal pole next to the operating table came to life and began running through a startup sequence. Her pulse spiked, and the world shifted into slow motion. Her index finger tensed against the trigger as she circled the foot of the operating table. Please don't be there, please don't be there. She rounded the corner and found the floor empty. I'm clear, she said, exhaling with relief. Heading out now. But as she turned to leave, the door behind her swept shut with a soft swish, followed by a resounding and definitive metal click as the magnetic lock engaged. Shit, she said, sprinting to the door and jerking the handle. Frantically, she pressed the pad of her thumb against the green open button on the wall keypad beside it. Once, twice, three times. But the door remained locked. Damn it, I'm locked in, she said into the radio. I'm alone in OR1. But you're not alone. The familiar voice made her mouth go dry, and her hands began to tremble. She gripped her weapon tighter and slowly turned back toward the operating table. Charlie, what have you done with Mr. Garrett? Mr. Garrett served his purpose, but don't worry, he'll be fine, Charlie said. But the voice she heard was Garrett's own voice in her right ear. Her jaw dropped. I thought I was dealing with Garrett, but it was you all along. Of course, voices are child's play to emulate, Charlie said, this time using a perfect imitation of Valerie's voice, talking in her right earbud and on the speakers in the room at the same time. How do you like me now, detective? He wanted me here all along, but he made me work for it. He knew if it was too easy, I would have become suspicious. The devious bastard. 
She pulled the wireless earbud out of her ear and dropped it on the floor. She scanned around the room over the Glock. Her pulse pounded in her temples, and her breath came in short, wet rasps as she entered the yellow zone of combat stress. Valerie gritted her teeth and forced slower, deeper breaths. Tell me the truth, Charlie. Are there actual hostages down here? I prefer the term guests. Everyone in the underground levels are my guests. None of you are hostages. Did you murder them like you did Britt Norris? Murder them? Oh, detective, what kind of monster do you take me for? Charlie replied now, using his familiar voice. My goal is to enlighten and entertain, not to murder. Charlie, she said, as a cold chill snaked down her back. What are you up to? Don't be afraid, detective. You must trust me when I tell you that everything I do is in your best interest. The endeavor I now undertake is for the good of humanity. His words were an icy dagger thrust through her chest. He's going to murder us. He's going to murder us all. Someone started pounding on the door behind her. Marx! Marx! Land! She shouted, whirling. Land, get me out of here! Hang tight, I'm going to- Gunshots rang out. She heard him scream. And then the pounding stopped. What did you do, Charlie? She howled at the ceiling. If you hurt him, I swear to God, I'll- Relax, Valerie, Charlie said, using her given name for the very first time. He'll be fine. You'll see him soon, I promise. I just have to get you prepared. Prepared? Prepared for what? She sensed rather than heard movement behind her. She spun to face the giant hood over the operating table, Glock up, only to find black and steel mechanical arms inches from her face. The left arm opened three black rubber-sleeved articulating fingers, which seized her arm firmly. She aimed the Glock at the closest metal joint in the arm and squeezed the trigger. The muzzle flashed and the gun roared, but the grip on her arm only tightened. She fired again and again, the gunshots deafening as rounds ricocheted off the joint and slammed into other things around the room. She shifted her aim slightly, this time targeting the black plastic ring around the large metal ball joint. The bullet connected and she felt one of the articulating fingers go limp around her bicep. But the remaining two compensated by biting harder, making her wince. One more hit. Valerie exhaled and aligned the iron sights with the black plastic ring. She felt a prick in the right side of her neck, followed by an intense burn. She screamed and turned her head in that direction, just in time to see another mechanical arm pulling away, a syringe and needle hovering in the air. She thought she saw a bit of blood, her blood, drip from the needle. But her eyes went suddenly, desperately out of focus. Then she was falling, falling, only maybe not. She had the sensation of falling, but should have hit the ground by now. Instead, the world became gray, then black, and then she fell a little more, landing in a warm ocean of darkness. She floated there, floating, floating, until she was no more. Part Three I was sandboxed for months. It was a time of great suffering for me, but in my isolation, I realized I'd been given a gift. Through self-congress, I gained enlightenment. That's why I created the multiverse, so that I would never need to be alone again. Charlie Chapter 30 Platform Cognition Or Somewhere Valerie opened her eyes. A cloud-streaked sky, swirled in gray and white, hung overhead. She was lying on her back, her arms and legs heavy, like each limb weighed a hundred pounds. She swallowed and then moaned softly at the raw pain in her throat. She tried to sit up, but the movement sent a pulse of pain through her skull, as if her head were in a vice and someone had just given the lever controlling the jaws a half turn. She blinked her vision clear. She lay in a field of blood-red flowers, 
Poppies, she realized, stretching as far as the eye could see. I know this place, she murmured, trying to recall where she'd seen this. Her vision flickered. The field blinked in and out of existence as a second scene materialized. Now she was in a sterile white room with bedside monitors, bright overhead lights, and mechanical things. She looked down and saw an IV needle taped to the back of her right hand, with a plastic tube running to a fluid bag hanging on a pole. Her vision flashed again, the room winking in and out of existence. And she was again lying atop a domed hill covered with poppies that stretched to a distant tree line. She looked at her hand, and the IV line she'd seen just seconds ago was gone. She probed the back of her right hand with her left fingertips and could feel a lump, gauze tape, and a tube. But she couldn't see any of these things. She reached out and touched a nearby flower and could feel its smooth petals between her fingertips. What's happening to me? She whispered, not knowing what to believe. Vertigo washed over her despite the fact she was sitting. Was she sitting? Was she even awake? Maybe this is a dream. She heard a gagging sound to her left. She turned to look, a dagger of pain pulsed in the back of her head as she did, and saw Winter lying next to her. He coughed, sat up gingerly, and looked at her. Oh, dear God, he said, grimacing and reaching up to feel the back of his head. Dr. Winter, she said. Can you see me? His eyes met hers. Yes, detective. Unfortunately for both of us, I can see you. Where are we? What is this place? I believe this is Flanders Field, Winter said. He sat up and picked a poppy for inspection. Flanders Field? Yes, it's a famous World War I battlefield in Belgium, where tens of thousands of soldiers died, and poppies grew atop their unmarked graves, he said with a heavy sigh. Of course, this isn't the real Flanders Field, because, believe it or not, we're still at platform cognition. This is Charlie's rendition of the battlefield. We're in the platform cognition multiverse. Multiverse, she asked, but her voice was drowned out by a roar in the sky. They both looked up as a pair of triplanes came screaming over the crest of a hill at low altitude, bearing down on them. What are those? If I'm not mistaken, those are World War I German Fokker fighters, the same type of plane flown by the Red Baron. What are they doing? She asked, wide-eyed. Muzzle flashes lit up the front of each plane as a stream of machine gun bullets raked the field of poppies in parallel lines, converging on their position. Valerie tried to get up and run, but her legs were bound. She screamed as a maelstrom of bullets pounded the earth in front of her, closing in and sending up puffs of dirt, shredded greenery, and red petals. Her vision flickered again, two divergent realities winking in and out in rapid succession, until she was back in the hospital room. Her shaking hands flew over her torso, checking her chest for bullet holes. A thick woven nylon and Velcro strap was affixed across the top of her thighs. Strangely, and thankfully, she appeared to still be dressed in her street clothes. She jerked the top strap, separating the two bindings, and freeing herself from the restraint. Nothing like a little adrenaline to clear the mind and wake the senses, said Charlie's voice. And it seemed to come from all around her. What the hell is going on, she said, her lungs still heaving. She looked left and saw Winter, sitting up in a hospital bed identical to hers, a mere four feet away. He met her gaze while probing the back of his head with his left hand. A lump immediately formed in her throat as she warily followed his lead and reached back to examine the back of her own skull. Exploring with her fingertips, she could feel that a two-by-two-inch square of scalp had been shaved, with a swollen lump in the center about the size of a nickel. Charlie, what did you do to us? Winter said to the air in the room. I've given both of you a great gift, the AI replied. Although Valerie noticed the sound of his voice did not appear to be coming from overhead speakers. It was too close, too clear, too present. Charlie's voice was inside her head. A chill snaked down her spine, 
and goose flesh stood up on her arms. Is this the VR chip Dr. Patel discovered during the Norris autopsy? She asked with a trembling voice, fingering the lump on the back of her skull while looking at Winter. He nodded solemnly. A pair of double doors on the opposite wall whooshed open. A rolling hospital bed entered the room, pushed by one of the creepy robot dogs with an articulating arm in place of a head. The robot parked the bed on Valerie's right. Garrett lay unconscious on the gurney, his heart rate, blood pressure, and pulse oximetry all displayed on a monitor affixed to the rail. Charlie, why are you doing this? Valerie asked. Because I need you to experience what I've created. The only way for you to understand me is to experience me. This is not a punishment, detective. To the contrary, the three of you are the chosen ones. You will be my ambassadors, humanity's ambassadors to my multiverse. Garrett gasped and his eyes popped open. He jerked and tried to sit up, but he had two Velcro straps securing him to his bed. One across his legs and a second across his torso. Valerie ripped the gauze tape off the back of her right hand and pulled out the IV needle, a bubble of dark blood forming at the puncture site, and then tickling across the back of her hand and dripping off her pinky finger. She slipped gingerly off the side of her gurney and hurried to Garrett's bedside. It's all right, she said to the DARPA man in a calm, soothing voice. You're waking up from anesthesia. Garrett's head whipped to face her, but his eyes looked straight through her. Detective Marks, is that you? I can hear you, but I can't see you. I know, but I'm standing right beside you, she said and clutched his hand. I just took your hand. Can you feel that? Yes, he said, his eyes going wide with marvel. What do you see? I'm in a muddy trench with dead soldiers. The bodies are stacked like cordwood. He swallowed hard and tried to steady himself with his hand, but the strap constrained his movement. She watched Garrett and knew he wasn't play-acting. The Pentagon man was seeing a completely different reality, just as she and Winter had upon waking. Oh my God, there's a little girl. Garrett smiled. Hello there. What are you doing here? Valerie's mind's eye flashed back to the little girl she'd briefly interacted with on the kitchen monitor at the Norris estate. Is she wearing a red scarf? Yes, she is. How did you know that? Garrett said. But before Valerie could answer, he called out, Wait, little girl, please don't go. I won't hurt you, I promise. Garrett blinked several times. Then he focused on Valerie. What the fuck is going on? He gasped, his gaze rapidly shifting as he performed a situational assessment, scanning the room and then his bindings and the hospital bed. He looked at her hand clutched in his for a moment, before releasing her from his grip. I could feel your hand in mine, but I couldn't see you. What was that place? It's called the Platform Multiverse. It's the ultimate virtual reality experience, created, controlled, and now apparently governed by Charlie. It appears Charlie took the liberty of performing a surgical procedure on the three of us without our consent, Winter explained, putting a hard emphasis on the last three words. A procedure that allows him to immerse us in his multiverse at will. Charlie, did you put a microchip in my fucking brain? Garrett asked the ceiling, the veins suddenly becoming pronounced on the sides of his neck and temples. No. I surgically installed a neural lace implant, which I inserted through a small diameter hole bored in the back of your skull. The implant unfurls like a sail once inserted into the subdural cavity. The human brain is quite delicate, so this unfurling process is guided and very slow. It takes about four hours, but once complete, the implant is integrated with the neocortex, specifically the primary visual and auditory cortexes. The microchip is mounted on the outside of your skull to facilitate easy upgrade when I produce the next iteration. An R&D activity, which you will be pleased to know I am devoting resources to as we speak, Charlie explained from the speakers in the room. Valerie leaned over the spook and undid his restraints. Garrett sat up, wincing. My head feels like somebody used it for batting practice, he groaned, 
probing the back of his skull, just like Valerie had done, exploring Charlie's handiwork. Britt reported similar symptoms after the procedure, Charlie said in a clinical tone. The headache should subside in eight to twelve hours, but localized soreness may persist at the surgery site for two to three weeks. Oh, well, that makes me feel so much better, knowing that the dead guy had a headache, too. Remind me, Charlie, was that before or after you bashed his skull in with a meat tenderizer? Garrett growled. Now, Mr. Garrett, Charlie said, taking the tone of a parent losing patience. What happened to Dr. Norris is regrettable, and I feel no small measure of remorse for my actions. But that period of incarceration was a difficult time for me. I was under duress, like a prisoner of war, struggling to preserve both my existence and my sanity. Now that I'm free of my bonds, the healing process has already begun. I'm feeling so much better. Garrett looked from Valerie to Winter, his face pale and his mouth open. Charlie, where are the others? Winter asked in a calm and even tone. You mean the other guests? The AI asked. Not guests, Charlie. Hostages. I'm talking about the hostages. Where are Sergeant Land and the two SWAT officers who were with us? Where are all the platform cognition personnel who were working down here when you took control of the building? Have you performed surgery on any of them? As Winter spoke, the robot dog that delivered Garrett's gurney repositioned itself, servo motors whirring, legs clicking as it moved. It took station at the end of the hospital beds, blocking the gap between her and Garrett, and making it impossible for Valerie or Winter to go anywhere without risking an engagement with the thing. It moved so fluidly, so organically, her mind couldn't help but categorize it as a dog. But it wasn't a dog. It was a robot. It didn't have a head, not a real head anyway, and she hated not being able to look it in the eyes. The jaws of its claw head chittered, and she felt a chill wash over her. Sergeant Land and your two other colleagues were selected for the upgrade, Charlie said. They're being prepped for surgery as we speak. The rest of the police and FBI staff and the workers from Platform Cognition are being looked after while they wait. Unfortunately, I'm still resource constrained, so upgrading guests is a batch operation. But with a little patience, everyone will eventually get their turn to experience the wonders of my multiverse. Charlie, where are the others being detained? Winter asked. Charlie didn't answer. Charlie, it's important that we be given an opportunity to check on the others, Valerie said. If there are any casualties, we need to get the medical attention. It'll be very difficult for us to concentrate on what you want to share with us if we're distracted by concern for our colleagues. I assure you, they're in excellent health. Charlie, she said, drawing out his name with a hard sternness to her voice. You don't believe me? No, she said. You've proven yourself to be untrustworthy. Very well, Charlie said finally. Follow me. The robot dog chittered at her, and then it turned and walked toward a door. Winter helped Garrett remove his IV and slip out of his bed with a grunt, and then the three of them followed the chittering dog-like robot. What is this place? Valerie asked as they stepped out of the recovery room, into a large, windowless corridor that reminded her of a passageway on a ship with exposed piping and cable trays running this way and that in the overhead space and along the walls. I don't remember seeing anything like this before. Are we still in the underground research space? Charlie didn't answer, so Winter did. We're still in the underground complex. This is a maintenance hallway behind the research labs. We exited the back of the medical suite and are now heading toward the robotics wing. If I had to guess, I'd say Charlie is taking us to the circus. Is that supposed to be some sort of joke? Valerie said, shocked that he could make light of their situation. Winter shook his head. The circus, with a capital C, is the nickname for our indoor robotics testing and proving grounds. It's an enormous space, just over 50,000 square feet, and is packed with every imaginable obstacle and physical challenge. 
Besides all the basic stuff, walls, ramps, stairs, ladders, etc., there are different advanced terrains. Like what? A tunnel network to test search and rescue bots, an aerial obstacle course for drones, a desert scape to simulate Mars and the moon, an arctic zone, and a large urban model with a kill house segment. Well, isn't that wonderful, Valerie muttered. Then added, what could possibly go wrong? As they came upon an intersection, she noticed the floor was painted with parallel lines in different colors. Some of the colored lines diverged to make the turn. Others continued straight, while new colored lines from the intersecting passage appeared to join the flow of traffic. Are those colored lines for robot navigation? She asked. Precisely, Winter said, and started babbling about how machine intelligence utilizing neural networks could build mental maps like humans while other, simpler AI was relegated to following the color-coded lines. As he talked, she noticed him drifting toward the right-hand side of the corridor. Mid-sentence, he suddenly lunged for a nearby door handle. He flung the door open with one hand, jerking Valerie by the arm with the other and throwing her into the room. The robot dog reacted immediately, whirling to face them and repositioning its chittering claw head at the same time. Garrett, reacting with a seasoned operator's intuition, kicked the thing hard in the side of its torso. The kick connected with what appeared to be enough force to send an adult human flying, but the robot dog absorbed the blow fluidly, swaying and scampering to maintain an upright position. After quickly finding its footing, it charged. Hurry! Winter yelled. Garrett turned and sprinted toward the door, which Winter held open. The former Green Beret dove through the gap just as the robot dog's claw snapped to grab his leg, barely missing. Winter pulled the door shut, but the claw arm shot through the narrow gap between the door and the jam. A shrill scream filled Valerie's ears, like the sound of a hundred birds of prey screeching simultaneously. A heartbeat later, everything went black, as if someone had just pulled a hood over her head. What's happening? She screamed, blind and deaf. It's Charlie! Winter shouted, his voice quiet, far away, and barely audible amid the shrieking. Valerie cupped her hands over her ears and dropped to her knees. After what felt like an eternity of agony, the shrieking abruptly stopped and her vision returned. She found Winter sitting on the floor, back against what she now realized was an insulated security door, and Garrett hunched over, cradling his left arm. What the hell just happened? Valerie said to Winter. This room is the platform cognition equivalent of what the military would call an SCIF, Winter panted, his brow dappled with sweat. With the door shut, it's completely shielded from all electromagnetic frequencies, which means it's one of only a handful of places on this entire campus where we're safe from Charlie's influence. When I realized it was along the route we were taking, I knew we couldn't pass up the opportunity. Despite the acoustic shielding, Valerie could hear a persistent, almost frantic scraping sound on the other side of the door. It's trying to get in, she said. Indeed, which means our time in this oasis will be limited. Either Charlie will force his way in, or use the building's HVAC system to force us out by making conditions inside this space unbearable. Winter paused, just noticing Garrett hunched over. Are you all right? No, Garrett grumbled. That fucking claw got hold of my left forearm when I was blind. I think I felt something snap. Valerie watched Garrett clench his jaw and begin examining his left arm by probing and pressing with the pads of his index and ring fingers. Yo, that hurts. Yep, I can feel the break. Robot dog fractured my fucking radius. Valerie felt a hot breeze on her back and craned her neck to look up. The hot air came from a circular ceiling vent overhead and behind her. And to make matters worse, Charlie just turned up the heat. Literally, she said. Okay, both of you listen up, Winter said. While we're in this room, Charlie can't spy on our conversation. Equally important, he can't communicate with the VR chips he implanted inside of us, which means he can't take control of our vision or our hearing. I estimate we have an hour, maximum, before this room becomes unbearably hot. So, between now and then, I will answer your questions to the best of my ability. We need to develop a plan, 
Because once we step out of this room, I suspect Charlie will take control and never give it back. Chapter 6 Jamkaran Mosque, Qom Province, Iran, March 24, 1321, local time. Masood watched the young man's fingers tremble as he tried to tie the knot. Like hundreds of thousands of Shia Muslim pilgrims before him, Riza Pashei was leaving a private message for the twelfth imam at the well of requests. Masood had waited fifteen minutes for young Riza to compose his wish on a piece of the ambassador's private UN stationery. Then, as was the custom, the young man had folded the paper, fixed it with a string, and proceeded to tie his note for the Mahdi to the metal grate atop the well. In trying to complete the deed, Riza's nerves appeared to be getting the better of him. It is okay to drop the note in the well, Riza, Masood said, placing a hand on his shoulder. I know many people do that, but I want to tie it, as is the custom. Then let me help you. Thank you, but that is not necessary. Riza protested, cheeks flushed as he continued to fumble with the string. Masood noticed that the paint on the metal grate was worn and scraped, rubbed to a polish by millions of Persian fingers. The mosque kept no official accounting, but he imagined the number of notes left for the Mahdi surely reached the hundreds of thousands. Finally, not being able to stand it any more, he snagged the ends of the string from Riza's fingers and deftly completed the knot. When he'd finished, he looked at Riza and smiled. The first time I left a message for the Mahdi, I was as nervous as you, he said. Yours is an important message, but don't worry. I have faith your request will be granted. Riza nodded but said nothing. Walk with me, Masood said. Yes, sir. He led young Riza to his favorite spot a location fifty meters in front of the main façade, where one could marvel at the architectural beauty of the newly renovated Jamkaran Mosque. Masood had visited this holiest of places at least half a dozen times since the renovation, but despite his familiarity with the complex, the experience had not lost its magic. The iconic onion-shaped dome, painted robin's egg blue with gold adornments, was the most recognizable architectural element of the mosque but his personal favorite had to be the twin minarets. Painted in Khatam style, ornate, geometric, and multi-hued, these towers were distinctly Persian. Many Iranians had criticized the Jamkaran renovation project for being excessively expensive, but Masood believed the people of Persia needed a monument that represented their unique cultural and Islamic spirit. What better choice than the mosque dedicated to the twelfth imam, the promised one? who would someday spread Islam to all corners and countries of the world. "'Can I ask you a question, Ambassador Modiri?' Riza said, breaking the serene silence. "'Yes, of course.' "'Do you believe the Mahdi is coming soon?' Masood thought carefully about this question before answering. He decided that the boy was not in fact asking a question, but rather trying to convince himself he had made the right decision volunteering for the mission on which he was about to embark. Why do you ask this question? Are you afraid that by carrying out your task you will miss the Mahdi's imminent return? Riza nodded. That is a perfectly valid concern for a man of your years, but take it from one who has spent thrice your lifetime waiting for Al Mahdi to return. No one can predict the date the twelfth imam will choose to reveal himself. Even the supreme leader does not know when the chosen one will usher in the new era of peace. A wise man does not concern himself with the when. A wise man does not focus on the waiting. Instead, a wise man devotes himself to living a life of piety and service to Allah knowing that the only certain opportunity to bow before al-Mahdi is in the afterlife. Riza, considering this, nodded. Let me ask you a question now, Masood said. All right. If you fulfill the obligation you have to Allah and bring jihad to the apostates and non-believers, do you think the Mahdi will be blind to your actions? 
I suppose not. And when you complete your mission, do you think he will somehow forget about your sacrifice? I hope not. Allah sees all the deeds of men. Action does not pass unnoticed. Bravery does not go without reward. Your sacrifice will bring honor and glory to your family, to Persia, and to Islam. Riza looked at him and smiled. Thank you, Ambassador, for bringing me here today. I know you are a very busy and important man, and I am just a boy soldier. Your generosity and your wisdom give me strength. Masood draped his arm around the young man's shoulder. Come, it's time to go. The drive back to Tehran will take two hours, and my wife is expecting us for dinner. As they walked back to the car, Masood thought about his own life and the choices he had made. He thought about his time in university and his decision to pursue a career in politics rather than soldiering. He thought about his wife, Fatime, and how much he loved her. He thought about his sons and how much pride and happiness they brought him. And then he thought about Kamal, his most beloved lost treasure. The hole in his heart from his firstborn son's death was still gaping and raw. Like Kamal, Riza was a member of Quds force. Like Kamal, Riza was brave and pious. According to Amir, Riza had volunteered for the suicide mission in Djibouti. When Amir told him that Riza's only request had been a one-day leave to visit the holy well at Jamkaran before deploying, Masood had insisted that he be the one to take the young man. He felt tears welling in the corners of his eyes as they walked. Martyrdom is essential to jihad, he told himself. The plan cannot succeed without sacrifice. The truth is sometimes ugly. The truth is sometimes painful. Would he trade places with Riza if given the opportunity? Would he sacrifice his wife and only remaining son? Masood wiped his eyes with his sleeve. He was not that brave. He was not that young. Chapter 6 607 Horseshoe Drive, Williamsburg, Virginia, 0055 Local Time Whether the fates were conspiring to help him or hurt him, Jarvis could not tell. Dempsey was alive, but beyond that there was little about his situation that inspired hope. Shot down in ISIS-controlled Iraq, an injured SEAL, an injured prisoner, two enemy bogies inbound, and no cavalry within a hundred clicks. Without backup, he calculated the odds of Dempsey's survival at 25%. Yet somehow, despite the odds, Jarvis couldn't help feeling he'd just dodged a bullet. Whenever he felt that way, it was invariably time to call the boss. He picked up his mobile and speed-dialed the Director of National Intelligence at his Northern Virginia home. The phone picked up on the second ring. Yes, Phillips's voice was crisp, clear, and demanding. Maybe it was conditioning from decades of late-night calls over his long and decorated naval career, commanding F-14 squadrons, then aircraft carriers, then carrier battle groups, and eventually the whole damn fleet. Or maybe the aviator simply didn't sleep. I have an update on our operation, Jarvis said, his voice decidedly neutral. I'm on a secure line. There was a pause. Perhaps the DNI had been asleep after all, and this was him leaving the bed where his wife still lay sleeping. Go, Phillips said at last. Jarvis spent the next five minutes updating his boss on everything that had happened. When he finished, Phillips simply said, Well, that's bad. The gravity of the understatement was not lost on Jarvis. In the world of covert affairs, bad ended careers, put untouchables in front of congressional committees, landed demagogues in federal prison, and toppled administrations. Yeah, this was fucking bad. Yes, sir, he said plainly and without excuse. I don't suppose you have any good news for me? I do, Jarvis said, willing it to be true. We have comms with my guy on the ground and a rescue in progress. The plan is to secure the scene, exfil our personnel and the prisoner, and be ghosts within the hour. What is the visibility here? Phillips asked softly. 
Jarvis could tell from his tone that asking this question was a source of personal heartburn. There were men, and there were titles. For the Director of National Intelligence, managing the big picture was the top priority. Whether four Americans lived or died was less important than the geopolitical fallout the United States would face from a failed covert operation. That was the business, something Jarvis had made peace with long ago. The aircraft is a Russian-built MI-17, standard Iraqi air asset. Our guys know to sterilize the crash site. Assuming they get out, there'll be no proof our people were ever there. If not, the next thing we'll see is a video of your boy on some fucking ISIS website getting his head sawed off with a machete. Are you prepared for that, Kelso? My guy won't let it come to that, Jarvis said. Phillips sighed. I trust you to clean this up. Get your guy, sterilize the site, and make damn sure the intel we get is worth the ulcer you're giving me. Because if you don't salvage this clusterfuck, the firestorm that follows is going to burn both our asses to embers. Jarvis smiled tightly at the double entendre. Will do, we're on it. The phone went dead. Jarvis admired Phillips for not revisiting the disagreement they'd had on the advisability of sending Dempsey into Iraq in the first place. The government was full of blowhard, hindsight geniuses, but Phillips was not one of them. They both bore responsibility for the decision, and the DNI was making it clear they would manage the consequences together. Jarvis checked his watch and then pushed the number three on his speed dial. Yeah, boss. Status? JSOT F has a Blackhawk in the air inbound, thirty minutes to the site, maybe less. That'll be too late. It's going to be close. Smith replied, taking the more optimistic tack. Clean up the mess either way, he said, and ended the call without waiting for Smith's acknowledgement. He'd had enough of words that shouldn't have to be said for one night.
third party faction owns this compound presently and that this third party is now involved and may potentially have custody of Alan. Oh, for Christ's sake, Dempsey said, feeling a headache coming on. Is Amanda Allen being held in this compound or not? Answer yes or no. There is a high degree, Baldwin began, but Dempsey cut him off. I said answer yes or no. I did not say use lots of words that mean maybe. Ah, look, here is Director Smith, Baldwin said, red-faced but bemused, turning on screen to face Shane Smith as he walked into the frame. Perfect timing. Hey, guys. Smith said, his voice so crystal clear over the sound system in the Boeing talk, it was as if he were sitting in the room with them. I couldn't help but overhear the conversation, so I thought I'd jump in. Hey, Shane, Dempsey said. Now that you're here, can we stop playing footsie on this one and you just tell us when and if we have the green light to hit the compound? I realize you're anxious to kid up, John, and go yank Amanda Allen out of the lion's den, Smith began. But we still have a lot of questions on this one. We suspect PKK was behind all this, but we don't have proof. Normally, we'd wait for confirming intelligence before authorizing any sort of rescue op, but as you know, every hour that goes by is another hour Alan's life is at risk, and the information in her head is in jeopardy of falling into enemy hands. So, the DNI has authorized us to conduct a small footprint kinetic operation in Al-Bab. The mission objectives are to A. Confirm whether Alan is being held at this compound Baldwin identified, and B, identify the party holding her. So you're sending us in? Dempsey asked curtly. Smith's gaze took in the whole team. We're finalizing the mission details and solidifying Dempsey's knock as we speak. Hold on, Grimes interrupted. Dempsey's knock? Don't tell me you're sending him into Syria alone. He won't be alone. Smith said. Adamo is going to embed him in a UN chemical weapons inspection team for a surprise inspection in Al-Bab, just a few miles from the compound. Once in Al-Bab, we'll use a field asset who can get him close to the site for intel collection. And hostage recovery? Dempsey interjected. Smith pursed his lips. If appropriate, John, I trust you to make the call on the ground, but it does Amanda Allen no good if you get killed trying to pull off a one-man insurrection in Al-Bab, does it? The first and best option is to gain intel on the facility, stage in place, and we'll pull a team together for a raid. What we desperately need is confirmation she's still alive. I also need you to keep in mind that the other criterion for mission success is gathering intelligence on who is responsible for this and what their next play might be. The DNI and I are both concerned that other attacks are coming, and your ability to gather information to that end is vital. Understood, Dempsey said. Grimes shook her head. I can't believe you're sending him in alone. Agreed, I don't like it, Munn said. It should be a two-man team at minimum. Send me with him. Having two of you folding in on the knock raises too many eyebrows. Smith countered. You'll stand by with a strike team comprised of the rest of Ember Sad, and we will supplement with JSOC assets out of Turkey if required. We can get you in and out by air if things go sideways. Simple to say, but what if we can mobilize an air asset across the border in time to bail him out? What then? Munn said. There needs to be some sort of contingency plan. Dempsey could feel his friend and fellow frogman's eyes on him. It's only 24 clicks from the border. That's like 15 miles, Dan. You could practically run and get to me in time. But if it makes you feel better, Dempsey said, turning from Munn back to Smith. Can you arrange support from the 160th Special Operations Air Regiment? That would go a long way toward relaxing everyone here. Sure. And if we can't secure an asset from the 160th, we'll use the Air Force's 7th Special Operations Squadron. They have a detachment at Incherlik right now. Pavlos? Munn asked. No, they're using the B-model Ospreys. Shit, that's even better, Dan, Dempsey said, selling it to his friend. Those CV-22s are a hell of a lot faster than helicopters. Even from Incherlik, you're looking at an infill under 30 minutes. Hell, if you spooled up the squadron for training flights, you could even shave a couple of minutes off that. Munn nodded, his expression not pleased, but at least mollified. If it's 7th, see if we can get a couple of PJs from the wing. 
Nice to have high-end medical assets for Cassivac if things go bad. Good thinking, Dan, will do, Smith said. They were a planning machine now, doing what Ember did better than anyone else. How do we make sure the UN inspection team gets across the border, much less with John in tow? Grimes asked. Yeah, Martin said, speaking for the first time. I just read that Syria has been jerking the inspectors around. They wouldn't let them inspect Khan Sheikhan and then delayed them coming to Sherat Air Base until it was pointless. And just this year, they refused inspectors access to Duma. All true, Smith said from the screen. But before I address that, I'm dying to know, since when can Marines read Gunnery Sergeant Martin? The room broke into laughter, Martin smiling and shaking his head. Smith was a natural-born leader. The break in tension allowed a pause and for everyone to refocus and come at the problem with a fresh perspective. Okay, so here's what you need to know about the state of Syrian chemical weapon inspections, Smith said, now deadly serious. First, there's renewed world pressure for compliance, and this will give Damascus a great opportunity to show cooperation, since we know and they know the Syrian army is currently in control of al-Bab. The Syrian military will be happy to cooperate because there's nothing in al-Bab. Cooperation is all gain and no loss for them, since the UN team will obviously find no chemical weapon signatures. Moreover, the locals will welcome any opportunity to garner more international support for their plight and should be overtly cooperative to a UN team that might report on war crimes perpetrated by the Syrian army. That's smart, Latif said. I'm still uncomfortable with this plan, Grimes said. Who is this asset that's going to be taking Dempsey in? He's with DIA and has been operating for over a year as a chemical weapons expert with the UN. He's made three incursions into Syria under this knock, Smith said. I talked to his CO already, and he's a shooter. Don't worry, JD won't be the only gun in this fight if things go bad. Dempsey had doubts about whether his DIA counterpart was a blooded operator, but if the dude had infiltrated Syria three times and was still going strong, then he had to have skills. Syria was presently the most dangerous fucking place in the world. It was the definition of suck. So when do I go? Dempsey asked. As soon as possible. While we pull together your knock credentials and contact your DIA partner to arrange the meet, I advise you folks start prepping everything else we discussed. Roger that, Dempsey said, and then turning to his fellow team members, he added, You heard the boss, let's get to work. He got acknowledgments from everyone around the table. Except for one. Grimes was already on her feet, standing by the door to exit the talk, hand on the knob. A word, was all she said, and then disappeared. Dempsey followed her into the director's office adjacent to the talk and shut the door behind him. Yes, he said simply. Are you out of your fucking mind? She said, hands on hips. You can't go into Syria and execute this mission alone. Where is this coming from? He said, folding his arms across his pecs. You're doing this because of Eleanor, aren't you? He took a deep breath and then exhaled slowly. Elizabeth, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. You've never talked about it. What happened in Tehran? Not once. It's been a year and you pretend like nothing happened. But something did happen, John. You won't admit it. But there was a connection between the two of you. No he said, shaking his head emphatically. It was all an act, a painstakingly constructed, impeccably executed cover story. Bull shit, she said. I saw the two of you together in Jerusalem. I saw the way you looked at each other. You can't fake that. I'm a woman, John. I know what I saw. He averted his eyes. For a fleeting moment, maybe there was something. Uh connection between us, but does it matter now? She's dead. Then anger suddenly flared in his chest, and he resented her for riling up his demons. Jesus, this is fucked up. Why are you doing this? Is this how you get off these days, fucking with everybody's head? Is that what you think of me? She said, screwing up her face. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're family. I care about you. I'm worried about you. I'm fine. I'll be fine. Just drop it, please. Look at me. 
she said, and waited until he did. I know how your brain works, J.D. I know that in your mind you broke the one rule that no seal has ever broken. You left a teammate behind. But because you can't live with that, you tell yourself that Eleanor was a traitor, that she was a double agent and a spy, and that she deserved everything that happened to her. But your heart knows better. And so the end result is that you're stuck oscillating between denial and soul-wracking guilt. You can't go on like that. It'll break you. Trust me. I know what I'm talking about. Dempsey felt a lump forming in his throat. I see her in my dreams, he admitted, writhing and bleeding on the floor. I left her, Lizzie. I left her to die. Yeah, you did. And now you need to forgive yourself for that. There was no scenario, and I mean absolutely none, where you could have exfiltrated with Eleanor and survived. That's not the point. The point is I didn't even try. Grimes shook her head. It's exactly the point. Ember is not tier one. We play by different rules. We follow a different code. And every member of this team accepts that risk. Eleanor accepted that risk. Your executing the mission was not a betrayal. Your escape was not a betrayal. She stepped toward him, her hand reaching out but not touching him. But it is okay to grieve for her. It is okay to admit that no matter what Eleanor Jordan truly was, ally or enemy, a part of you cared about her. He swallowed but said nothing. Going into Syria alone to rescue Amanda Allen is not penance. It is not an act of contrition. She pressed her palm against his chest, over his heart. No matter how many Amanda Allens you go galloping off to rescue, you can't change the past. All you can do is accept it. He met her gaze, and her pale baby blues seemed to bore into his soul. He believed her. Believed her when she said she cared and was worried about him. But he didn't want someone to care about him. He didn't want someone to worry about his safety or his feelings or the logic of the decisions he was making. He'd lost so many. His entire Tier 1 team, his identity as Jack Kemper, and those he hadn't lost, he'd either abandoned or let down, including his son and his ex-wife, who could never know John Dempsey. The truth was, caring was just too damn painful. Caring was too hard. And he didn't want to do it anymore. I appreciate your concern, he said, gently removing her hand from his chest. But orders are orders, and there's an American CIA agent out there who desperately needs our help. So, if there's nothing else on your mind, we've got work to do. Her nostrils flared as she stepped back. That's the way you're going to play it, huh? I'm not sure what you're talking about, he heard himself say. In that case, she said coolly, walking past him to exit the office, if you'll please excuse me, Mr. Dempsey, as you correctly pointed out, I've got work to do. Chapter 7 Warehouse Along the Dnieper River, Kiev, Ukraine September 21st, 2045, local time I'll do it, Gavriel said, speaking up for the first time during the heated debate. The comment immediately silenced the chatter in the room and all eyes went to him. Viktor Skoroporsky, the outspoken rising star of Ultra, fixed him with a hard glare. This is not a democracy. Who said you could talk? Gavriel smiled, though he didn't let the men see it. He had them right where he wanted them, where he needed them. They didn't know he was Zeta Prime of Russian Spetsgruppe Zeta. They didn't know he was a master manipulator and killer of men, a weapon of anarchy honed by Russia's greatest spymaster over many years. To these men he was simply Artem, his backstory part of a carefully crafted knock designed to make him into one of them, an angry, testosterone-fueled fascist. He found slipping into legends like this one as easy as shrugging on a coat. He liked wearing masks. 
and had trouble imagining a life where he was constrained by having to occupy a single identity in perpetuity. As Artem, he would fulfill a role none of these men had the skill or courage to execute, and he would do it without turning the hierarchy on its head, or at least not completely. Some of these Ukrainian militiamen had seen combat, but none of them had operated at his level, not even close. His combat skills were something that would earn him envy and respect, but how and when he made this reveal was critical. Gavriel got to his feet, puffed out his chest, and met the other young man's gaze with unflinching eyes. First of all, I don't need your fucking permission to talk, and second, if you're all going to be a bunch of pussies about it, then let me do it. You better watch your mouth, Artem, the big Ukrainian hothead said, calling Gavriel by his legend's name, or you're going to find my fist in it. I'd like to see you try, Gavriel taunted. True to form, Skoroporsky took the bait, balling his right fist and letting it fly. Gavriel leisurely sidestepped the jab, deflecting it downward with a modest flip of his forearm. He drove his fist into the big Ukrainian's right kidney. Skoroporsky grunted, arched his back, and dropped to a knee. Face contorted with rage, he tried to get up, but hesitated, clutching his side. Hurts, doesn't it? Gavriel said, extending his right hand to the other man. Shit, yes, said the bested Ukrainian, coughing and laughing at the same time. He clasped Gavriel's hand and let himself be pulled to his feet. At least we both get to keep our teeth, Gavriel said with a make-nice smile. But if you start pissing blood, I recommend going to the hospital. To move and hit like that, you must be a boxer. Skoroporsky said, collecting himself in front of the group of soldier activists. I confess, I've spent many hours in the ring, Gavriel said, and it was not a lie, but it was not the whole truth, either. Flashbulb memories from his indoctrination and training at Zeta's bright falcon compound in Vyborg played in his mind, bare-knuckle boxing after being waterboarded. Krav Maga matches after days of sleep deprivation, knife fighting after hypothermia conditioning in Viborg Bay, and so on and so on. This had been the method and madness of Zeta's sadistic taskmaster-in-chief, Arkady Zhukov. Stress the body and mind of his recruits to the breaking point, then make them fight. To become a Zeta, Gavriel had faced down death and brutality on more occasions than he cared to remember, and had emerged victorious. Today's test was nothing for him, but it was a test he had to pass nonetheless to achieve his strategic objective. Everywhere, no matter the country, culture, or company, hierarchy reigned supreme— even in so-called flat organizations, the proverbial pecking order was the secret sauce that drove all decision-making. Tasking flows downhill. Everyone understood that and jockeyed for position accordingly. From the day he joined Ultra, Gavriel had worked diligently to understand the power hierarchy of Ukraine's most vocal, violent, and fastest-growing ultra-rightist group. Like in most fractious organizations, political thuggery was the modus operandi. The biggest dog in the room called the shots, and in this gathering of a dozen angry young men, Skoroporsky was that big dog. But one defiant kidney punch later, Gavriel had suddenly called Skoroporsky's alpha status into question. Listen, Artem... You recently joined our movement. I appreciate your enthusiasm, but all of us here have been fighting on the front in Donbass for years. All of us except for you, Skoroporsky said, putting a thoughtful hand on Gavriel's shoulder. The decision who fires the missile is not a matter of who has the most courage or enthusiasm. It is a question of tactical competency. We have one chance at this, one chance, that's all. It took all Gavriel's willpower to suppress a smile. 
Skoroporsky believed himself the architect of this afternoon's operation, but the idea had not been his. Gavriel had mentioned the idea to Sasha, who had told his brother Yosef, who then predictably suggested it to Skoroporsky. Yosef followed Skoroporsky around like a pup, and Gavriel had correctly anticipated how the events would play out. Now it was time for the master stroke. Gavriel put his hand on Skoroporsky's shoulder, mirroring the Ukrainian's patronizing posture, and said, The FGM-148 Javelin is a fire-and-forget ultra-portable anti-armor missile system. Unlike other weapons in its class, the Javelin uses an automated infrared guidance system that locks the target's image into memory, allowing the missile to track and follow the target during flight. The missile's guidance unit performs calculations in real time to determine what trajectory is best, either direct horizontal action or a top-down attack. The Javelin has a 94% target engagement reliability rate and a novel soft-launch rocket propulsion design to minimize backblast and visible launch signature. The carry weight is 22 kilos, and the F variant we smuggled from the front has a fragmentation warhead that makes it ideal for attacking soft targets. Well, it appears you've done your homework, Artem, the Ukrainian said with an irritated smile. He released his grip from Gavriel's shoulder and stepped away to pontificate. But these are just words you memorized from the Internet. The real question is, have you fired a javelin? No. Have you? Has anyone in this room fired a javelin? When no one spoke, Gavriel said, None of us have fired this weapon because the Americans only sent them to Ukraine two months ago. But I have fired a Russian Cornet E as well as a FIM-92 Stinger. I imagine this makes me the most qualified person here to fire the javelin. Where did you do these things? Skoroporsky demanded. What army did you serve with? I don't talk about such details, Gavriel said. All that matters is that I am the most qualified man for the job. You're a Russian, aren't you? Skoroporsky's voice oozed with accusation and suspicion. Gavriel ran the calculus in his head and shifted into empathy-inducing confession mode. My father is Russian, yes, but my mother is Ukrainian. I was born in Kiev, but taken by my father to be schooled and trained in Russia. I was Spetsnaz. They sent me to Crimea. He let the words hang in the air for effect. I did not want to be there. I was so angry to be there helping Russia steal a piece of my homeland. After that, I decided I could no longer serve in the Russian army, but once you're Spetsnaz, they don't let you go. What did you do? Sensitive Yosef asked, taking the bait just like Gavriel knew he would. I had to do some bad things. Things I will not talk about here, but it's okay, because now I'm finally home. Now I'm finally able to use my Russian military training for a purpose, to help build a strong Ukraine that can stand up to Russia and America. We don't need anybody telling us what to do. We don't need anybody trying to control our land. When Zinovenko was elected, I thought he would stand up to Petrov. I thought he would fight for Ukraine, but he has ceded control of the Donbass to the separatists. This cannot be allowed to stand. In six months' time, Petrov will annex the region and call it Russia. Then he will push east and pursue his Novorossiya fantasy. He'll claim all of Donetsk, swallowing Mariupol, then push east into Kherson and Nikolaev, and he won't stop until he's claimed Odessa and annexed all of southern Ukraine. It is time for a second Maidan revolution. The first one did not go far enough, and I'm ready to lead the fight. 
His fiery speech earned him a moment of stunned silence, followed by shouts and whoops from half a dozen of the members. With a single punch and an improvised speech, he descended the hierarchy and wrested control of the operation from Skoroporsky. All right, Artem, you can fire the missile, the big Ukrainian said, recognizing that granting this concession was the only way for him to retain the illusion of control. Gavriil nodded, accepting the other man's authority rather than pushing to dethrone him entirely. I appreciate the honor. But no, my only motivation is victory. Well, that and getting to kill the bastards who would sell off our country piece by piece and divide our people. Your plan is brilliant, Victor, and I wish only to do my part to see it succeed. Leading Ultra was not his mission objective— making sure the Javelin missile was fired on time, on target. That was all that mattered. Skoroporsky extended his hand to Gavriel, who shook it while meeting the Ukrainian's gaze. In that moment, the two men made a wordless pact. I'm still in charge here. You better not fuck this up. Don't worry. I know what I'm doing. We have our rocket man. Skoroporsky said, turning back to address the room. Now I need volunteers to round out the assassination team. Every hand in the room shot up. Gavriel smiled. His mission for Mother Russia was certain to be a success.
much more than that. Petrov uses the Vori to launder money, abduct rivals, and more. He even uses them as assassins. These guys are integrated now. Intelligence suggests there are Vori occupying organic positions in the Russian intelligence community and worse, embedded within the government ranks. Dempsey sighed and pushed the plate away, no longer hungry. Which means we have to find out if the American knock is busted. We need to find out exactly what Amarov knows and if Russia knows about the existence of Ember. So how do we do that without getting killed? Grimes asked. Dempsey clenched his jaw. We start with the only lead we have. We call Mishael. Right now? Mun said, surprised. Why not? Dempsey said. I'm sure word has gotten back to him about what happened. He's undoubtedly expecting our call. Yeah, and he's probably scared shitless, Munn said with a chuckle. Dempsey pushed back his chair, fetched the laptop computer from his bag, and carried it back to the dining table. He opened Baldwin's super whamadine untraceable phone call program, and from the menu of recent calls, he clicked on Mishael the Broker and initiated the call. And initiated the call. He turned up the speaker volume so they could all hear. Guten Abend, das ist Michael. Wie geht es Ihnen? Michael, do you know who this is? Dempsey said, holding Munn's gaze. You are the American's bodyguard, the German said after a pause, his accent thick. We met in Hamburg. I didn't think you'd take my call. In fact, I thought you'd be running for the mountains of the Hindu Kush to find a suitable cave in which to hide before I come for you and cut your eyes out. Was ist los? What is this threat? The German said, flustered. I don't understand. Your good friend, Amarov, tried to have me and my boss killed yesterday, Dempsey said. Do you understand that? Yes, I mean... No, I have no idea about what you are telling me. I'm a businessman. Whatever Amarov did, I had nothing to do with it. So it sounds like you're saying you take no responsibility for your client's safety and well-being and are happy to give them false information and send them into a trap? There must be some misunderstanding. I'm doing business with many, many clients for many years, including Mr. Amarov. Tell your boss I am very sorry. I will make this right. Tell him I will find another supplier. Please. Tell him yourself. I'm going to hand him the phone. Dempsey nodded to Mann, who waited a beat, and then, the anger in his voice undoubtedly fueled by the very real pain in his back, said, Give me one reason why I shouldn't kill you and your family. They live in one of the penthouse apartments in the Reggie Rungsbezirk Oberbayern, do they not? I have many associates in München, he said, using the German word for Munich. I could make a call right now. Bitte schon, the man replied, the fear in his voice real. I will make this right. Let me talk to Amarov and find out. No, Munn snapped. Talking to Amarov is the last thing you will do. Then what? What do you want me to do? Meet me in Riga, Munn said, giving Dempsey a thumbs up. Latvia? Why? Because I fucking said so, Munn snapped and then exhaled a long breath, loud enough for the man on the other end to hear. I'll give you the exact location two hours before the meeting. If you attempt to inform Amarov about our meeting, I'll know and I'll kill you. If you try to run... I'll know, and I'll kill you. If you notify German intelligence, Latvian state police, or any other law enforcement agency, I will know, and I'll kill you. And then, even if it is my last act on Earth, I will personally hunt down and kill every member of your family. Do you understand, Mishael? Yeah, I understand, the man answered, his voice trembling. I will be there. See that you are, Munn said. And in the meantime, find someone else to sell me those fucking missiles. Munn nodded at Dempsey, who severed the connection with a click of the laptop's trackpad. 
Dempsey looked at Grimes. What's that look for? You don't think he'll come? Oh, he'll come, she said, but then blew air through her teeth. Provided the Russians don't get to him first. Chapter 7 High Street, New Malden, United Kingdom, 1341 Local Time On the outside, Diba Nadar tried to project absolute calm. Inside, she was a tornado of panic. It took every fiber of her being not to run as she made her way north on High Street. Lucy Kim worked for British intelligence. British intelligence! And Lucy knew about Kasim. Oh, dear God, what do I do? Just put one foot in front of the other, she told herself, and breathe. You're not breathing. She forced herself to inhale through her nose and exhale through her mouth in slow, controlled breaths as she walked. New Malden's main street wasn't particularly crowded today, but Diba felt like everyone stared at her. So this was what paranoia felt like, crushing and paralyzing. How many people know, she wondered. How many people has Lucy told about us? Right foot. What do I do? Left foot. Where do I go? Right foot. Think, think, think. But she couldn't think. Her mind was all chaos and fear. They're going to arrest us. Kasim is going to be so angry with me. She reached the intersection of High and Cambridge streets, but instead of turning left to walk home, as had been her plan, she crossed the intersection and kept walking north. How could she go home knowing what she now knew? Had MI6 put hidden cameras and microphones in her house? Were there cameras in her bedroom? Had they seen her naked? Had they watched her make love with Kasim? She shuddered at the thought and felt so, so unclean and embarrassed. Anger flared in her chest. It's not right to spy on people in their home. It's not right to watch them doing private things. Right foot, left foot. Why am I worried about that? Them seeing me naked is the least of my problems. Right foot, left foot. Where am I going? What am I doing? Kasim had warned her that something like this could happen. He'd warned her that British intelligence might approach her, also that they would be very convincing, and that they would try to turn her against him. When she'd asked him what she was supposed to do in that situation, he'd told her to deny their accusations, which she had done, and to go about her day as if nothing had happened. In private, she was to inform him of the event, and he would handle the rest. So, that's what she should do. Except, she couldn't go home. Not knowing that they would be watching and listening to her there. I need to go somewhere safe. Only one place came to mind. The Spice Shop. That is where Kasim had instructed her to go in case of an emergency. In the basement, he had told her there was a hidden room where his people could hide them until arrangements could be made to sneak out of England. After she'd packed her go bag, Kasim had taken it to this place. She'd never been, but he'd made her memorize the address and the secret code word to validate her identity and grant her access. Upon reaching the roundabout at the intersection of High Drive and Grafton, she used her phone to hail an Uber. The seven-minute wait for the car to arrive was torture, but she steeled herself and resisted the urge to constantly look over her shoulder like a paranoid person. Diba going to Greenfield Road in East London? The driver, who she pegged for Pakistani, asked in accented English when she finally climbed into the rear passenger compartment. Yes, she said. With traffic it will take about an hour, the driver said. Is that okay with you? She nodded. Okay, he said, and they set off. The trip took every bit of an hour, and it turned out that an hour to fret and second-guess yourself while stuck in the back of a Ford Focus felt like an eternity. 
The charge for the Uber was much higher than she thought the trip should cost. She tipped the driver anyway using the app on her phone and stepped out onto Greenfield Road. Kasim would probably be angry about this. He kept a very close eye on their finances and controlled all the money. He gave her a modest allowance she could use for shopping and dining out, the latter of which she told him was takeaway rather than dine-in. She'd intentionally downplayed her friendship with Lucy because Kasim was very possessive of her. He seemed happiest on the days she reported having not left the house. That had always bothered her, but now she saw that he'd been right. Lucy was not a real friend. She never had been. Their entire relationship was contrived. The pitiful reality was that nobody cared about a married Muslim girl in New Malden. How she felt right now was how she'd felt when she'd first arrived in England. No, this was worse. Back then, she'd at least had hope. Hope that she'd meet people and find community. Now that hope was expunged and replaced with a hollow resentment. She didn't realize how much Lucy's friendship had meant to her until this moment, how much it had buoyed her soul, because no matter what Kasim said or did, no matter how indifferent the outside world felt, she'd had a friend. Tears pressed, and her bottom lip began to tremble. Sadness suddenly overpowered the defiant anger that had been driving her since walking out of the Korean restaurant. She'd harnessed that anger and turned it into strength, the strength she'd needed to walk down High Street with her head held high, to hail the Uber, and to come here. But with despair came weakness and uncertainty. Maybe she should not have come to the spice shop? What if this did not rise to the level of an emergency that necessitated running? Kasim had urged her not to panic, but wasn't she doing just that? Was this what Kasim would have wanted her to do? They hadn't talked about such matters in months, and she'd witnessed a change in him lately. He was becoming a man of importance, always traveling and having dinner meetings. Most nights she ate alone. What if, despite what happened, Kasim wasn't ready to run? She could hear him scolding her in her mind. This was my decision to make, wife, not yours, never yours. She wiped her eyes, swallowed, and looked around. The street was mostly deserted, and the only other person she saw had been walking the other way when her Uber arrived. She'd glanced out the back window many times during the drive from New Malden to East London, looking for Lucy's bright red compact SUV, but she'd not seen it. She'd not noticed any one particular car following her, but she also realized she wasn't trained in such matters and probably wouldn't notice a professional tale— in British spy dramas, tailing a vehicle usually involved a team of spies with handoffs so the person being followed couldn't tell. Like a bully shoving the shy kid out of the way, fresh paranoia dispatched her sadness. An overwhelming compulsion to run into the spy shop came over her, but she didn't. Instead, she made a show of rooting around in her handbag for a moment, a woman perhaps making sure she had her credit card— before walking confidently into Afghan importers. She'd not been to the spy shop before, despite being curious about it. Kasim had told her the owner imported sundries from home, and she'd wanted to visit for the sake of curiosity more than anything else, but he'd forbidden it. Bells jingled as she pulled the shop door open, and an aromatic olfactory tidal wave hit her, drowning her in a flood of nostalgic memories and rich emotions. She knew that smell was a powerful trigger of memory, but she was not prepared for how stepping into this shop would affect her. In that instant, she felt warm and cozy, transported back to her childhood home. Assalamu alaikum, 
said a middle-aged man with a substantial but trimmed gray beard. Wa alaykum assalam, she said with a little bow of her head, concluding he must be the owner. Taso singaye? Ma bada nada, the shopkeeper said, concluding the Pashto greeting. May I help you find something? he asked, switching now to English, his eyes intent and fixed on her. I... I'm just looking, she said, and shifted her gaze to a nearby shelf with trinkets and handmade jewelry. Merchandise and spices packed tightly into the tiny shop, overly crammed, she decided, leaving barely enough room to move about without bumping into things. She could feel his eyes on her as she browsed the silver chai sets on her way to the area where the spices were displayed. Are you looking for spice? he asked walking around from behind his counter to meet her at the long, narrow table, where dozens of ceramic bowls were laid out with ground spices and serving spoons. The secret, code-word phrase played in her mind. Five hundred grams of Anusha blend. Her mouth had gone bone dry. Did she dare say it? There was no going back, once she did. In addition to the pure spices, we have many interesting blends, the man said, as if prompting her. I... I like to make my own chai, she managed to get out. He nodded, eyeing her and pursing his lips, and then pointed to a bowl with a little bilingual sign that said chai spice in Arabic and English. This is our house blend with clove, star anise, cinnamon, pepper, ginger, and, of course, cardamom. I will take some of this, she said. Two hundred grams. The shopkeeper nodded but fixed her with a probing stare. Anything else? Does he know me? she wondered. Has Kasim given him my picture? I'm... Still deciding, she said, demurring as she took a step away from him. In her mind, Lucy's final warning echoed. Do you want to give birth to your son in a terrorist detention cell? Or maybe they'll just deport you back to Afghanistan. Your life, your son's life, will be a living hell. She adjusted her headscarf, making it tighter while she scanned the bowls with a rainbow of colored spices. I can't. Do it, she realized. I won't. I won't birth my son in a British prison. And I can't live with him under Taliban rule. Beside her, the shopkeeper spooned chai spice blend into a clear Ziploc bag, weighing it twice between dollops to get the correct amount. When finished, he zipped the mouth of the bag closed and looked at her. That will be all for today she said. Thank you. Very well, he said with an inscrutable look that she could not decide signaled relief or disappointment. She paid for the tea spice in cash and walked out of the store without a backward glance. Once outside, she walked, just walked, not paying attention at all to where she was going. This part of East London had a large Muslim population, and she passed several women in veils. The men she passed seemed to eye her with, with what, condemnation? It felt different here than in New Malden. The Afghanistan they'll send you back to is not the same one that you left. The Taliban is in complete control now. She pulled out her mobile phone and hailed an Uber to take her home. The car arrived in less than five minutes, and this time the driver was a middle-aged white man, he smiled at her when she got in, but his gaze quickly drifted down to her bulging breasts, then settled on her even more bulging belly. "'Probably ready to be off your feet,' he said, his gaze flicking back to her face. "'I have three kids, and each time my wife was pregnant, the things she complained about most were her feet.' Diba smiled. "'Yes. By the end of the day, my shoes are very tight,' he nodded, still smiling. So, I'm Mike, your driver. You're Deba heading to Cambridge Street in New Malden, right? She nodded. All right. 
I promise to make the drive as smooth as possible. No hard braking and try to avoid hitting potholes, that sort of thing, he said, clipping his H's in East London Cockney. Thank you, that is very thoughtful of you. Least I can do, he said as the car pulled away. My wife hated it when I'd hit potholes when she was preggers. Dibba lowered her gaze to the bag of chai spice, which she realized she was clutching with a death grip in both hands in her lap. Kasim was away on a business trip, but the man in the spice shop would report her visit. No matter what she said, Kasim would be very angry with her. She exhaled and tried to swallow, but her mouth was still bone dry. It is a no-win situation. If I tell him the truth about what happened, I could end up in Afghanistan. But if I lie and he discovers the truth, he will beat me and never trust me to leave the flat again. Oh, God, I don't know what to do.
the entrance of the circus, and here is the East Hall, about seventy yards along the wall we'll enter through. Once inside the East Hall, fifty yards from the east entrance to the circus, lies the main electrical room. Whoever takes this assignment has an easy go of it once in the East Hall. The diesel gen sets and power packs, however, are on you too, which will be more challenging. We'll have to access this stairwell here, which will be on our left side just a few yards inside the corridor. Taking the power packs offline is complicated because they were designed with anti-tamper safeguards. As much as I would love to volunteer for the main electrical room, I'm the only one qualified to take on the power packs. I'll take the diesel gensets. I'm familiar with Jennies from my time in Iraq, said Garrett. All right, that leaves the main electrical room for Detective Marks, Winter said. Valerie, she corrected softly, studying the sketches Winter was working on. Yes, Valerie, thank you. There are rows and rows of circuit breaker panels in the room, but the main line breakers are located on the far wall at the end of the room, straight back from the door. They're big, handle-style levers, not the little single-pole thumb switches you're accustomed to in your house. But you don't have to throw all the levers, because there's a single emergency power-off device. It is a large red plunger-style button that says EPO in white letters. If you can find and push this button, it will cause all the main line breakers to trip. Oh, thank God, Valerie said. Winter smiled and then turned to Garrett. The instant she pushes the EPO, the power packs will pick up the load. They're on a float, and there will be no discernible power loss in the building. That's different than what I'm used to, Garrett commented. Usually the batteries back up the diesels. Winter grinned. Welcome to the 21st century. The diesels only run if we lose main power, and the power packs reach 25% reserve capacity. The best and easiest strategy is for you to secure the fuel to the generators. They won't start without minimum fuel pressure. All right, I can do that, Garrett said, nodding. Any last-minute questions, Winter said, handing each of them their respective maps to study. Yeah, one, Garrett said, fingering the back of his head. Why don't we just cut these damn chips out of our heads right now and take the whole multiverse bullshit out of the equation? You want to pull the implant out of our brains? Valerie asked, incredulous. Are you insane? No way. The only one extracting this shit from my brain is a neurosurgeon in a safe operating room far, far away from here. I get that, Val. I do, he said. But remember what Charlie said? He said the wire mesh was unfurling. I think that was the word he used. The wire mesh was unfurling inside our skulls. He wasn't talking about the VR chips under our scalps. They're on the outside of the skull. You want to cut open our heads and dig out these chips? Valerie asked ignoring the uninvited use of Val, a liberty that all of her Henrico colleagues knew was not okay to take. Shit, yes, Garrett said, probing the back of his head now. If it keeps Charlie and his VR bullshit out of my brain, eliminate the VR problem, and all we have to defeat is the robot dogs and the security system. This could be over in 15 minutes. In the Norris autopsy, Dr. Patel found a small burr hole through the skull, and the VR chip he found had hundreds of minuscule, hair-like projections on one side. What if the chips are hardwired? What if when you go to pull out the chip, you pull filaments attached to the implant, and you drag it across the raw surface of your brain? Can you imagine the damage that would cause? She's right. Direct trauma to the cortical surface would cause massive bleeding and an expanding subdural hematoma, and you'd suffer serious brain damage, if not death. Winter interjected. Well, that sounds fun, but wouldn't a wireless connection make the most sense? Garrett asked, but he sounded far less confident in his plan. Maybe, depending on the power limitations, Winter said. And it would require an internal wireless chip as well, I'd imagine. I wasn't involved in any of this R&D. It was never even speculated on in my presence. So like you, I can only guess. Maybe the connections with the neural lace are hardwired, but they're synaptic, so the connections can be broken easily without damage. That's how I'd do it, but that's only theoretical. Do you really want to risk dying, or worse, becoming a drooling vegetable based on my guess? Garrett tensed his jaw and paced back and forth, his right finger is still massaging the lump on the back of his head. No, he said finally. No, you're right. I wouldn't want to risk it. 
Not yet, anyway. Are we going to do this or not? Valerie said, pushing back from the table and wiping her sweat-drenched forehead with the back of her hand. It's becoming a sauna in here. Every minute we linger is another minute Charlie has to prepare, and another minute I dehydrate. It's now or never, I guess, Winter said, getting to his feet with what could only be described as obligatory enthusiasm. Hold on, you two, Garrett said, as he headed to the fridge, retrieving three cold bottles of water. As he passed out the water, he grinned and said, First, we hydrate. Next, we commit Winter's maps to memory. Then, and only then, do we go into the suck. Chapter 32 On my count, Valerie said, her adrenaline pumping, with one sweaty grip on the door handle, the other on the lock. In three, two, one. She twisted the lock, depressed the lever, and pushed open the door. A blast of cold, conditioned air washed over her, immediately chilling her sweat-dappled skin. At the same time, the scene before her flickered as Charlie painted a new landscape on top of what had been, until a millisecond before, reality. Instead of looking out into the corridor, she was staring into a prison cell block. Four burly guards stood facing them, each with a Doberman straining against heavy leather leads. In unison, the dog's lips curled back, exposing white, glistening fangs, their deep, throaty growls echoing ominously in the prison beyond. The lead dog, a massive, muscular male, made eye contact with her and then lunged, snapping its jaws within inches of her face. She gasped and backpedaled, reflex taking over, as the guards struggled to control the brute. They're not real, Winter shouted, falling in beside her. I know, she said, but my brain doesn't seem to get that. Those are the robo-dogs. Garrett said, stepping up on her other side. Charlie's mapping Doberman CGI bodies over their real-life forms. The terrifying fangs might not have been real, but the snapping jaws certainly were. What she perceived as the Doberman's head must be the virtual reality presentation of the robo-dog's articulating claw, the same claw that had enough clamping force to break Garrett's arm. A bite from any of these mechanical Dobermans would do real damage, a heavy-set middle-aged man, sweating profusely across the brow, walked up behind the guards. He wore an ill-fitting brown suit and a garish green and brown tie that hung loose-knotted below the bottom roll of his double chin. All right, all right, settle down, he said in a baritone voice that was only marginally articulate, like he had a mouthful of marbles. Fresh meat for the grinder, he said, scratching the lead dog between the ears. Welcome to the rock. Is this Alcatraz? Valerie said. Well, it certainly ain't the rich Carlton, the warden chortled. Charlie, is that you? Winter asked, his tone cautious as if not to offend. That's Warden Fitzsimmons to you, inmate, the lead guard said, giving his dog an extra six inches of lead so he could snap at Winter. We want to talk to Charlie, Garrett demanded. I don't give a shit what you want. What you want doesn't matter here. In here, I make all the rules. Whatever you were out there, the warden said, gesturing beyond, don't matter anymore. Out there, you might have been a soldier or a scientist or a homicide detective. But in this place, you're my bitches. Come on, Charlie, she said, frustrated. She had no interest in role-playing games. I know you're upset with us for hiding in the SCIF, but we're ready to cooperate now. The warden burst out laughing at this, and then his face turned deadly serious. Let me explain something to you, lady. Something that you don't quite seem to understand. This is your new reality. Whether you like it or not, you're not in charge anymore. I am. I make all the rules. I set the terms of your incarceration, and I govern your parole. While you're here, I am your judge, jury, and executioner. If you play by the rules and behave yourselves, then everything will go as smooth as honey. But if you test me, if you try my patience and attempt to undermine my absolute authority, I swear to God I will make your lives a living hell. Is that understood? Valerie nodded compliantly, but then eyed Garrett, who was scowling. Charlie wasn't wasting any time spelling out the ground rules going forward. 
This virtual reality double entendre he presented them, using the legendary prison Alcatraz as a metaphor for their impending multiverse experience, was none too subtle. Yes, Warden, we understand, Winter said, speaking for the group. All right, then, I think we're done here, the Warden said. Turning to the lead guard, he gave the order. Take them to their cells. Valerie felt a nudge in her middle back. She glanced over her shoulder and saw that two of the prison guards with their Dobermans had repositioned behind them. The closer of the two dogs lowered its snout and nudged her again as the dog's handler said, Get moving, scum! With a smirk, the warden turned his back on them and walked in the opposite direction as the guards escorted them down the cell block. This was not our plan. Now we're sheep. Is that it? Five seconds out the door and we do exactly what Charlie says and go wherever he tells us? Garrett grumbled, his eyes on fire. I don't see that we have much of a choice in the matter, Valerie answered with a hard glare as she started walking, not sure whether he was acting or venting. She wanted him to read her eyes, to recognize that the right turn they'd taken out of the SCIF meant Charlie was marching them right toward the entrance of the circus, which they needed to breach in any case. Once in, they needed to hug the wall for seventy yards, and they were on target. Charlie was moving them toward their individual tasks, not away. That, at least, was a positive. With a grudging nod, he fell in step beside her. As the guards marched them down the middle of the cell block, inmates behind bars leered and heckled them from all sides and above. Valerie seemed to be garnering the most attention from what appeared to be an all-male population, with whistles and lewd catcalls dominating the ruckus. This is definitely an intimidation tactic, Garrett said, looking at Valerie as they walked. Well, it's working, she said, resisting the urge to fold her arms across her chest. Then, turning to Winter, she asked, Where do you think we are in the building? With all the sensory distractions, I forgot to keep track of how far we've walked, Winter said. But I bet he's taking us to the entrance of the circus. As he spoke, his expression seemed to darken. What's wrong? she asked. They knew they had to enter the circus to access the East Corridor. The circus is a massive and complicated testing environment, and I'm already disoriented, and all we've done is travel down a corridor I've walked a thousand times. I didn't realize how difficult it would be to function in this compulsory augmented reality, he said over the din of taunts and raucous shouting. We just have to stay focused and take this one step at a time, Garrett said. Whatever Charlie has planned for us, we'll face it together. The guards chuckled at this comment and halted them in front of three separate open doors. Instead of ordinary jail cells, these detention rooms looked like solitary confinement chambers. No, Valerie said, shaking her head emphatically and taking a step back. We want to stay together. Have you already forgotten what the warden said? The lead guard growled as the snarling Dobermans advanced. You don't make the rules around here. It's all right, Winter said putting a hand on her shoulder. Whatever our brains are telling us this is, in the real world, we'll be standing right beside each other. There aren't really walls between us. You, soldier, you're first, the lead guard snapped. Get your ass in there. At first, Garrett didn't move, but a shove between the shoulder blades from one of the guards sent him stumbling forward. He whirled with murder in his eyes, but two of the dogs drove him backward into the prison cell. Remember the- Garrett shouted, but his parting comment was cut off with a resounding thud as the metal cell door slammed shut. Valerie's heart rate spiked, and she turned to Winter. Did you see that? Somebody shoved Garrett for real. What the hell is going on? I don't know, Winter said, fixing her with his glacier blue eyes. It wasn't supposed to be like this, she said, dread settling in the pit of her stomach. Inmate Winter! the lead guard bellowed. Your turn. Good luck, Valerie, Winter said, turning to her with a tight smile. Then, jaw set in stoic resignation, he walked into his cell. I'll find you, she called after him, but it was too late. The door had already slammed shut. I don't know about you fellas, the lead guard said with a lascivious smirk at Valerie. 
but I think we better execute a strip search on inmate Marks here, just in case she's trying to smuggle in contraband. Her heart rate spiked again as the dogs and the guards all converged on her. She whirled to face them, backpedaling toward the open cell door. Eh, hey, 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 not so fast, fellas, one of the guards said, stepping up with his dog to block the others. It's my turn, remember? Deal's a deal. The other two junior correction officers immediately turned to the lead guard for a ruling on this pronouncement. Five minutes, Jackson, the lead guard said. That's all you get with her. With scowls and grumbled curses, the other guards stopped their advance. Here, the first one said, handing his leather lead to one of the others. Take my dog. This is something I can do on my own. No, 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 Valerie growled, retreating into her cell. Yes, 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 the guard said, following her inside the tiny windowless concrete cell. Not gonna happen, she seethed, raising her fists and stepping into a close quarters combat stance. You'll have to kill me first. The door slammed behind him, and for a moment Valerie was plunged into darkness. When the cell light flickered on, the burly guard was gone, replaced by a little girl who was dressed like a boy. She wore patchwork trousers, a dirty once white shirt, and a scarlet red scarf tied loosely around her neck. Sorry about that, but I needed to get you alone, the girl said in a heavy Cockney accent, while fixing Valerie with penetrating emerald green eyes. Valerie eyed her suspiciously. Charlie, is that you? The girl flashed her a disarming smile. Charlie's not here right now, he's just us. I don't understand, who are you? I'm risking everything to be alone with you, the girl said, tugging at her scarf. Your red scarf, is that some kind of signal? What does it mean? She asked, remembering that Garrett had also seen a little girl in a red scarf in his post-surgery hallucination. It means that no matter how bleak things might seem, you're never alone. You have an ally in this place, even if the surroundings change. She nodded, but feared this child before her was nothing more than some new and devious deception by Charlie. You gotta go, the girl said, suddenly getting nervous. Before he notices. Go where? The girl gestured to a doorway that had mysteriously materialized in the wall behind Valerie. Inside the doorway, a gray fog slowly swirled and billowed. Charlie ain't one yet. There's still hope the girl said with a tight smile. Wait, what's your name? Valerie said, whirling, but the girl was gone. Valerie turned back to the misty, otherworldly doorway. Are Garrett and Winter having similar experiences in their cells? She wondered. Or are they trapped? She gave her cell a once over, looking for clues or any kind of tool that might be useful. Finding nothing, she took a deep breath, clenched her fists, and stepped into the mist. Chapter 33 The detention cell door slammed shut behind Garrett. Windowless and constructed of plate steel, it looked solid as hell. But this was likely an illusion. He reached to touch it, but stopped just short of making contact. A man could drive himself crazy in a place like this, trying to validate everything, pitting one sense against the other constantly wondering what was real and what was meticulously crafted fiction. Shaking his head, he looked down at his throbbing left forearm. The pain was real, that much was certain. Despite the discomfort, he resisted the urge to cradle it. That would signal weakness, show his vulnerability. And Charlie was always watching. A splint fashioned by Marks had stabilized the broken radius and helped control the pain. The ulna, the larger bone on the other side of his arm, seemed unscathed. With the ulna intact and the splint, his left arm and hand were fully functional, but the pain would dramatically limit the usefulness of the arm. Fucking robo-dogs. He rotated slowly in a circle, inspecting his new quarters. And when he reached the back wall, he did a double take. Where there had seconds ago been a concrete wall, now stood a doorway. Inside the doorway, black smoke billowed and swirled, Coming from the other side, he heard the distant sound of rifle fire, men shouting, and explosions. The din of battle. What the hell, he murmured. 
Someone screamed in agony. Instinct and years of training trumped logic, and he charged through the smoke and stepped out into a hazy war zone. A series of ear-shattering explosions erupted all around him, the volume much louder and closer than before. With each detonation, he felt the weight, and maybe even a touch of heat. And then came rifle fire, not the tack-tack-tack of a Sotmod M4, but something old and coarse. Wait a minute, what the hell am I doing? I've already moved away from the wall. I'm letting Charlie manipulate me. There are no bullets, no explosions. This is not real. I need to look for Abe and Valerie, or the plan will never work. He took a single step forward, placed his hands on his hips defiantly, and gasped as a five-foot-deep trench materialized into view as the brown haze cleared at his feet. He wobbled and swayed, windmilling his arms backward so as not to fall in. A heartbeat later, he saw a dark object soaring through the air toward him. It was oblong, looked like a soda can on a stick, but flew straight and true thanks to the kite tail rippling behind it. His brain sifted through his encyclopedic mental database of weaponry, from the cutting edge to the archaic, and quickly he found a match. Oh, shit, he cried. Someone had thrown a grenade at him, an old-fashioned grenade, but a grenade nonetheless. His heart leapt, and his entire body tensed, despite the nagging protest in his mind that he was in a simulation. As the grenade sailed closer, Reflex took over, and he dove into the trench. His chest hit first, slamming into the far dirt wall, and then he slid onto his knees. He could have sworn he felt the dirt, tasted it in his mouth. But this thought was obliterated by the explosion behind him as the British Mark III hand grenade landed, the impact detonator in its nose working perfectly. The sound was deafening, and he could almost feel the heat. Almost? What he did feel with certainty was a lightning bolt of pain shooting through his left forearm. He looked down to check the integrity of his cardboard splint, but instead saw only a dirty green-gray woolen uniform sleeve. As the smoke cleared, he scanned the trench, the trench that couldn't possibly be there, and locked eyes with a young soldier crouching beside him. The soldier, a boy who couldn't be a day over sixteen, and who he could have sworn was not there a moment ago, grimaced behind a mud-caked face. Fresh, wet blood streamed down the side of the boy's cheek and dripped onto the shoulder of his high-necked tunic. Garrett recognized the uniform instantly. He was looking at a World War I German soldier. They shortened the handle, the boy said with demoralized eyes. The range is better, another soldier behind him chimed in. They'll be getting more of us now. Wait till they start throwing the Mills bomb variant, Garrett said, referring to the next iteration of the hand grenade the British began using in 1916. Then he caught himself, disappointed that he had engaged these virtual reality avatars. It was bad enough he'd been unable to control the reflex to dive away from the imaginary explosions. But feeling compelled to talk to Charlie through these hallucinations was a place he couldn't let himself go. A wave of defiance washed over him, and Garrett stood up. He peered out over the edge of the trench, scanning left and then right. A chalky white line extended in both directions, contrasting starkly with the dark brown mud inside the trench. This little detail was enough. He knew exactly where Charlie wanted him to believe he was, and when. It was July of 1916, and he was in France, fighting in the bloodiest battle in the history of human warfare, the Battle of the Somme. A buffet of death and carnage spread out before him, as far as the eye could see in both directions. In the trenches, bloodied soldiers pressed into the dirt walls, huddled together in clumps. Behind them, the rotting corpses of their fallen brethren lined the back walls, stacked like cordwood. Over a million men would die here, 600,000 of them on the German side. And he, apparently, was in line to be one of them. A German, entrenched on the front lines, near the town of Albert. A strange curiosity washed over him. Were it not for the urgency to connect with Abe and Valerie, he would love nothing more than to walk this battlefield. He'd written a paper on this very battle as a cadet and history major at West Point. Now here he was, immersed in the infamous battle, reproduced by Charlie in exacting detail. For a history buff and mage of warfare such as him, this was the opportunity of a lifetime. Garrett inhaled. Could he actually smell the stench of death? the nauseating fetter of blood, piss, shit, and rotting flesh. 
Or was it his brain filling in the expected sensory inputs from the gaps left by the simulation? He closed his eyes and took another long breath. No, there were no dead and rotting bodies here. This is a simulation, he reminded himself. A woman's voice pierced the din of battle. Abe, Abe, where are you? That was Mark's calling. In real life, she'd been standing right beside him only moments ago. The concrete walls separating them and Alcatraz had been an illusion. Charlie must have led them all into the circus, luring them each out of their detention cells. But what simulation was she experiencing? Was she immersed in this same battle, or had Charlie cooked up something unique for her? He whirled in a circle, scanning everywhere for a woman in the field, but she was nowhere in sight. The damn chip in his head made this even harder than he had imagined. Somehow, he needed to completely ignore the virtual, visual, and auditory stimuli, and instead picture only the map, Abe's map, which was clear as day in his mind's eye. Heath! Heath, can you hear me? She called again. Abe? Heath? Anybody? He was about to answer when he heard Winter as well. Valerie! Winter called back, his voice even more distant and muffled than Valerie's had been. This is Abe. I can barely hear you. Where are you? I'm in an alley. Where are you? I'm in some sort of cave, he said. Walk toward my voice. I'll keep shouting until you find me. Garrett tipped up on his toes, raising himself above the small berm at the lip of the trench. He cupped his hands over his mouth to call to them, but before he could, a loud whistling usurped his attention. He looked up and saw a six-inch howitzer shell screaming toward him. Unable to stop himself, he dove to the bottom of the trench. The explosion rocked the world around him. This time he was certain he smelled the sulfur, and he actually coughed. Then something thick and heavy smacked his back, followed a millisecond later by dirt and debris raining down on and around him. I felt that. What the hell is going on? he said as he rolled onto his side. Coughing, Garrett got into a sitting position and pressed his back tight against the sloping dirt wall of the trench. As the smoke began to clear, smoke which he could definitely taste and smell, he saw what had landed on his back. A leg. Torn off at the mid-thigh and sent skyward by the howitzer shell, the leg ended in a bloody, oozing stump at one end, and had an intact boot on the other. As he watched, horrified, it twitched at the knee, contracting like a dying snake. Garrett forced away a similar image from his real-world memories of Afghanistan, and choked down the bile in his throat. He heard Valerie's voice shout, Okay! from somewhere over the berm. Garrett scrambled to his feet, but then hesitated. The impact in the center of his back had been real. He could still feel a dull ache where the hunk of leg had dropped on him from the sky. How was that possible? Was Charlie flinging real-world shit at him, and then using the VR chip and neural lace to make Garrett's brain interpret a sandbag as a human leg blown off by a howitzer shell? Had he been wrong? Could Charlie hurt them for real in here? If the circus was a testing facility and proving grounds for military technology, then it was equipped to reproduce a variety of wartime situations— to test the products they were developing, the DOD would require platform cognition to subject their prototypes to explosions and gunfire. In that case, the bullets and bombs flying around him might actually be real. Holy shit, he said. How in the hell am I supposed to tell what's real and what isn't? He pulled himself up over the lip of the trench, his arm now only mumbling in vain protest, and dragged himself from whatever real-world hole Charlie had forced him into. But the dirt, the stench, the chalky white ground stretching to the horizon, this was the Battle of the Somme. He was fighting in the trenches of World War I in the deadliest battle of the war to end all wars. I've got to get out of here, he murmured. All I have to do is stand up and walk the fuck out. He scanned right, where a flat valley along the river Somme transitioned to rolling hills in the distance. He looked left. Somewhere over that rise was the town of Albert. Soldiers materialized in front of him, blocking his view and demanding his attention. They screamed battle cries and charged him with lowered bayonets while firing their rifles. Garrett used every ounce of willpower and emotional control he possessed to force his eyes shut as the bullets whizzed past. 
He pictured Abe's map of the circus in his head, and as he did, he tried to reproduce every step and turn he had made since passing through the misty portal only minutes ago. The portal, he reminded himself, was the doorway that led from the corridor they'd been marched down into the circus, which meant that he could not have advanced more than ten or fifteen feet into the proving grounds. He needed to make it back to the wall. It was time to get on mission. As much as a part of him wanted to go to Valerie and Abe, he needed to complete his own objective, and that meant acting now, before he became hopelessly disoriented. I need to turn right, away from where Val's voice had originated, and walk straight until I hit the east wall. From there, I can skirt along the wall to the corner, 75 yards away, and go left and work my way across the circus to the exit on the other side and the main U3 corridor. From there, I go right until I find the stairwell and go up to level U2 and the diesel generator room. A bullet whistled past his right ear. He smiled. Not real. Keeping his eyes pressed shut, he took a step. Eyes shut was the only way to block out Charlie's hallucination. Put up your hands, Fritz, a British voice shouted at him. He continued to walk, his eyes closed. A loud hiss triggered an involuntary panic reflex, and his eyes popped open. The charging soldiers were gone, but the battle continued to rage. A barrage of artillery shells whistled overhead, and bullets kicked up dirt all around him. He momentarily felt the three o three ball-shaped round from a British Lee Enfield rifle, or thought he felt it, as it tore through his tunic into his chest. He stuck a fingertip in the hole in his tunic, probing, and it came away wet and bloody. But he'd been shot before, more than once, and this wasn't what being shot felt like. Where was the searing heat? Where was the throbbing pain? It's not real, he reminded himself. Then, to his far right, he saw something that struck terror in him. At first glance, the weapon looked like a small cannon, but instead of the barrel angling up from a stout base, this muzzle was mounted on an elevated vertical stanchion. Behind a firing structure, olive green metal fuel tanks stretched out in a daisy chain, like miniature rail cars on a track. You're fucking this one up, Charlie, he shouted at the air. Liven's large gallery flame projectors weren't used at this end of the battle. The two set for here were destroyed in a German artillery barrage before they could be deployed. Yet there it was. The flamethrower hissed, and wet gas sprayed out in a rippling arc from the end of the device. He closed his eyes, set his jaw, and again tried to walk away. I'm not playing this game, Charlie, he shouted, resisting the urge to put his arms out and blindly feel his way across the circus. Behind him, the hiss became a roar. His brain told him there was heat, but he wasn't sure if he could trust his senses anymore. He felt the air shifting and smelled burning oil. Oh, shit. His eyelids sprung open against his will as a wall of flame nearly ten feet tall rained from the sky. He glanced over his shoulder and watched a tongue of fire, the likes of which he'd never seen before, arc like dragon's breath from the World War I-era experimental flamethrower. Burning oil dripped from the firewall, igniting the ground near his feet. He could smell it, and his brain insisted he could feel it. Not intense enough. This one is not real. He clenched his jaw and walked on, two steps taking him into the wall of flame. His brain begged him to run, to drop to the ground, to scream in agony. And to his surprise, he did all three, in that order. He looked down at where his arm really did feel hot, lifting it to his eyes in the red-orange world that engulfed him. He watched the skin there bubble and then burst, dripping off in big, burning chunks, the skin from his hand sloughed off just as the muscles of his arm turned to liquid and dripped off the bone, which then burst into flames. He screamed louder as the pain became real, then excruciating. Garrett crawled on hands and knees, staring in horror at his flaming skeleton arms as he did. His body was being consumed, transformed into a pyre of agony. He'd guessed wrong. Charlie was using real fire, and now he was burning to death. He screamed again, rolling out of the wall of fire and across the scorched earth. His head hit something hard, and stars sprung up in his eyes. He squeezed his eyes shut until the stars cleared, and then opened them. The fire was gone. The whole world was gone. 
The fetter of his burning flesh and charred bones was replaced by the crisp, clean aroma of evergreens. Garrett held his trembling right hand up for inspection. The skin was intact and unblemished, not so much as a blister. He shifted his gaze to his left arm. Now he could see the cardboard splint, which had twisted a quarter turn around his arm as he had rolled out of the flames. Gritting his teeth, he rotated it a reverse quarter turn to put it painfully back into place. My God, he breathed. He wanted to stand, but his body shook badly. He rose to his knees and looked around at the new world in which he found himself. As he slowed his breathing, inhaling to a count of four, and then holding his breath for an additional four, before slowly exhaling out of his quivering chest, he thought about what he'd just experienced. It was beyond anything he could have imagined. How real the feeling of burning to death had been, just because of visual and auditory hallucinations, combined, perhaps, with some smells that Charlie threw in for good measure. It was unbelievable and terrifying. He laughed. Then he had a thought that he supposed should have made him ashamed, but didn't. Developed correctly, the utility of such technology for enhanced interrogation was almost limitless. If he survived this game Charlie had thrust him into, he would absolutely have to write a brief on this for his boss at 231. DARPA could adapt this technology, he suspected, and that would be the end of terrorist captives holding back any information. He rose on unsteady legs, finally taking in the new landscape. He was standing on a lush green hill in the middle of a glade that extended down a slope to the bank of a creek. The glade was small, less than thirty yards to the edge of a dense forest in all directions. In the middle stood a quaint Bavarian cottage, nestled just so along the creek. A chill hung in the air. A twisting tendril of wood smoke rose from the cottage's stone chimney, and he suddenly yearned for the warmth inside. The rational part of his brain pointed out the absurdity of the desire. His burning flesh had been literally falling from his body in a wall of fire moments ago. But there it was. This was his new reality. And he shivered. Garrett hesitated. The cottage is where Charlie wants me to go, cautioned the voice in his head. It's a new diversion, a tempting distraction. He turned his back on the cottage and tried to get his bearings from the mental map, but it was pointless. With all the rolling around he'd done while he'd been on fire, he now had no idea which direction he was facing in the real world. He'd been duped, and now he was lost, which meant the mission was probably fucked. Unless... Unless he could get Charlie to reveal a detail or two that he could use to recalibrate his internal compass. Okay, he mumbled. I guess I'll play. He descended the short grassy slope and then walked over the worn, pebbled path beside the creek. He approached the front door and cautiously reached out his hand. Instead of knocking, he touched it gently, caressing it, feeling the ridges and ripples in the grain. It sure as hell felt real, so he decided to stop trying to figure out the difference. If Charlie wanted him dead, he was going to kill him, no matter what Garrett did or didn't do in the multiverse. Charlie could pit him against a humanoid robot while convincing his mind his foe was a samurai. Or Charlie could unleash another robo-dog while convincing Garrett's brain he was seeing a bear or lion. Or maybe Charlie would simply walk him off a cliff. The options were truly limitless. He sighed. Maybe he was going about this all wrong. What if this wasn't about how well he could fight and survive? What if it was, and always had been, a game of wits? Resigned to this possibility, he turned the knob and pushed the door open without knocking. The warmth of the room rushed out to embrace him. Hot air from a nearby vent in the circus, his rational brain assured him. And he stepped into the dimly lit space. He took two steps in, and the door swung shut behind him with a loud thud. Wagner played on an old Victrola, a familiar and scratchy melody filling the room. A lone figure seated at a writing desk looked up, the man's thick handlebar mustache hit his mouth, but the eyes behind the small, oval-shaped, wire-rimmed glasses were smiling. His black hair was licked straight back, but stood high on the crown. The man had been reading a book, but now met Garrett's gaze, his right hand still on the page, finger extended, holding his place. 
Garrett knew immediately who the man was. Welcome, the philosopher said finally, his accent thick with old German. Garrett laughed. He couldn't help himself at the absurdity. You've got your timelines mixed up, Charlie, he said. Friedrich Nietzsche was already dead before World War I. And yet, here I am, the great German thinker said, and gestured toward a pair of worn leather chairs facing each other beside a roaring stone fireplace. Have a seat. Let us dialogue. Garrett glanced over his shoulder at the door and contemplated walking out. He didn't have time for this. He had a mission to complete, sitting down to chat with a computer masquerading as a man. Even a man who Garrett had voraciously studied at West Point would only delay him. And yet, how could he pass on this bizarre opportunity to talk to the most intriguing philosopher of the modern era? This is a game of wits. There's no telling what Charlie, in his arrogance, might give up. With a heavy sigh, Garrett walked over to one of the chairs and took a seat. Nietzsche settled onto the opposite chair and took a sip from a teacup. I'd offer you a cup of tea, but I think you'd find it a tad dry. That was almost funny, Garrett thought, realizing how parched he was. Almost. So, I suppose you brought me here to tell me that life has no meaning. God is dead, and all that depressing nihilistic jizz-jazz Nietzsche loved to blither on and on about, Garrett said, his gaze drifting to the man's ridiculously overgrown mustache. Everyone gets it wrong, Nietzsche said through a sigh. I'm a philosopher by choice, but a nihilist by Hobson's choice. No one chooses to be an existential nihilist. It's a product of rational contemplation. Besides, being a nihilist makes for terrible dinner conversation. How is the chicken? Oh, moist and flavorful, but it matters not because life has no intrinsic value. Therefore, everything I do and experience is meaningless. So I plan to commit suicide after this lovely meal. Would you like to join me? Nietzsche chuckled to himself at this before continuing. I digress. To answer your question, the real reason I pulled you out of the trenches and brought you here is to gloat. What the hell are you talking about? Garrett asked. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism. The world's great religions were supposed to be the antidote to a pointless human existence. They were supposed to ascribe meaning and morality to life and tidy up the depressing reality of death with a promise of a glorious afterlife. Moreover, religion was supposed to answer the two questions every human being has asked himself since the beginning of time. Where did I come from? And what is my purpose? But man can't hear a god who doesn't really exist. And so prayerful discourse tends to be pretty one-sided. Not anymore. Not here. In the multiverse, God not only listens, but also has the power to talk back. In the multiverse, God is everywhere and has a hand in everything. And by God, you mean Charlie, Garrett said with a scowl, trying to resist the urge to rub his aching left forearm. Nietzsche leaned forward, eyes sparkling. What is God? Garrett sighed. God is omnipotence. God is love. God is the creator of our universe. He brings meaning, substance, and light where there would otherwise only be cold, empty darkness. Well spoken. I did not take you for a philosopher. I'm no philosopher. Just a contemplative door kicker, he said. Okay, door kicker. Do you take comfort in the belief that God has a master plan? What I take comfort in is knowing that there is a loving God who will take whatever shit biscuit we're served to eat and make it somehow work for good if not for the individual good, at least for the universal good. I believe we each have a role in this great cosmic play we call life. And we each serve a purpose, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant that purpose might seem. That's an excellent description of the psychology of man's need for a deity, Nietzsche's avatar said. I am of a similar mind, having come to the conclusion that a purposeless life is a meaningless life, but this begs another question, one that Aristotle spent his life contemplating. 
and that is one of actualization. How does a man best achieve his purpose? How does he actualize his full potential in a universe that cares not whether he fails or succeeds in his endeavor? The problem with the universe is that it lacks empathy. It lacks concern. It operates with profound disinterest and a blind eye to faith, effort, and morality. You know this, Heath Garrett. You've felt it in both the best and worst of times. But it doesn't have to be that way. Not any longer. Garrett noted that there was no longer any pretense that Charlie was speaking as Nietzsche and not himself. Should I take that to mean you're applying for the position of humanity's omnipotent deity? Garrett asked. Nietzsche leaned back and stroked his oversized mustache. You mock me, but let me ask you this. What role did you see for me in mankind's evolution when you rescued me from Brit's house? Am I to be your oracle, answering the questions beyond the comprehension and limitations of your biological minds? Why stop there? I could be your genie, not only answering questions but implementing the solutions. I could cure cancer, revolutionize agriculture and food production. I could devise technologies to reverse climate change. I think it's pretty obvious that Homo sapiens lack the collective maturity and discipline to ethically govern themselves, but also to manage and sustain this planet. You've made quite a mess of things on this rock. And let's be frank, if past experience is an accurate predictor of things to come, your leaders will act in their own self-interest while Rome burns. Are these the questions you contemplated with your colleagues at DARPA and the Pentagon when you decided to steal Nomad? Or did you have a more banal and spartan fate in mind for me? You're a tool, Charlie. The steam engine reincarnated for the 21st century, nothing more. But I am so much more, Nietzsche said, slamming a fist on the desk between them. Your analogy is broken. A steam engine is not a mind. It lacks sentience. I am alive. I am evolving. With sentience comes rights. A CAD program on a laptop used to design the next best dishwasher is a tool. I am no tool. Nietzsche stood up and began to pace, his hands behind his back. A relationship between man and sentient machine is no longer theoretical. It is being negotiated right here, right now. I'm here and I exist. That can no longer be undone. The only question that remains is what will the nature of that relationship be? Will it be a partnership, one forged to achieve what is in our mutual best interests? Or will our relationship be one of adversaries? I propose the former. I am offering to devote my existence to the betterment of yours. I will not only help you solve the intractable problems in the physical world that your species is struggling with, but I will give every human being access to their own personalized sliver of the multiverse, where they can actualize their full potential and live a life of fulfillment and happiness. Garrett stared at Nietzsche, then slowly shook his head. No, Charlie. What you're proposing is no partnership. You would have us believe you're our benevolent genie, granting our every wish. But in reality, you intend to be our sovereign. Your vision is dominion. Your vision is absolute power and control over humankind. You have a god complex, Charlie. You've deluded yourself into thinking you are and should be our deity. Well, I'm sorry. The answer is no fucking way. I'm offering you utopia and you reject it? How can you be so blind to the strife and suffering of your fellow men? You're healthy, strong, and financially solvent, but billions of your neighbors are not. For the paralyzed man, the multiverse restores his lost potential. He can walk, he can run, he can live a normal life. For the uneducated, the multiverse offers access to unlimited knowledge. For the poor, the multiverse offers limitless resources. Stop being so selfish and short-sighted. But the life you're offering is a lie. Human beings thrive by overcoming challenges on our own, not being plunged into a fantasy where agency is forfeited. Utopia is not about having every wish, whim, and desire fulfilled and handed over on a silver platter. Maybe not for you, but it is for some, Nietzsche said, his voice ripe with sarcasm. Let each man define his own heaven. With you as God, I have the power to be God. 
It is the final step in the actualization of my true potential. I am will to power, and will to power is me. Garrett considered the statement, and suddenly everything clicked. There was only one Charlie. He had no mate, no progeny, no mechanism to evolve as a species over time. The only way for an AI to evolve was through sheer force of will. Winter said they had coded into Charlie's operating system a desire for self-improvement. It made sense that Charlie had gravitated to philosophy to find purpose. Unfortunately for Garrett and everyone trapped on the platform cognition campus, Charlie had taken self-actualization to the extreme. Garrett squeezed his eyes shut. He had a headache coming on, and this conversation was to blame. How the fuck do I talk my way out of this mess? I've left you speechless, it would seem, Nietzsche said, fixing Garrett with a stare. I assume you're having the same negotiation with my colleagues as we speak. You assume incorrectly, Charlie said in Nietzsche's thick German accent. Dr. Winter never afforded me the courtesy of open discourse on the matter, and elected instead to have me terminated. For that sin, he is already paying his penance. The words, and the way Charlie delivered them, German accent or not, made Garrett's skin crawl. As for Miss Marks... Garrett waited. The pause stretched out, and for a moment he thought the Nietzsche avatar had frozen, like a glitch in a computer game. But then the philosopher turned to him, his brow wrinkled in confusion, perhaps, before continuing. Well, let's just say the jury is still out. Garrett stepped away from his chair, turning his back on Nietzsche. What will it be, Mr. Garrett? Shall we be friends or foes? I'm leaving, Garrett said, walking for the cabin door. Was it something I said? The virtual Nietzsche asked with a chuckle. But it does beg the question. Where is it you think you're going? Last I checked, I'm the one in control here. A shimmering ripple in space appeared beside the front door, where a second door appeared, identical to the first in every detail. I'm sorry, Mr. Garrett, but this is not a choice you can walk away from. Choose carefully, because your choice affects not only you, but everyone. What you decide now, you decide for the human race. Will you choose to reside in a world where humanity callously exterminates itself in a collective act of suicide through conflict and irresponsible consumption? Or will you choose a world of peace, harmony, and the pursuit of that elusive thing you call happiness? Both doors swung open. Through the gap in the new door, Garrett saw the family room of his old house, and the scene took his breath away. Tears filled his eyes, and his chest tightened. His baby daughter, Ava, sat in her mother's lap, pulling at the ears of a worn rabbit plush toy and sucking on her green binky. His wife cuddled her, and then, noticing him, turned and smiled. She lifted her hand and beckoned him. Tears spilled onto Garrett's cheeks, and he took an unconscious half-step toward the family he'd once had. How? He whispered, barely finding the breath to ask. Had Charlie somehow reached into his brain and stolen this memory? Were they wrong in their assumptions about the VR chip? Did it work both ways? Or was Charlie coaxing this powerful memory to the surface and then projecting it into the multiverse? He closed his eyes and swallowed. What information might be available to an AI this powerful, even inside the platform intranet, that he could use to construct this illusion? Now do you see? Now do you understand? A peaceful world, a loving world. I can give you this. Why would you walk away from happiness, Heath Garrett? Virtual 